Well, hello there, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. And if you're new to the podcast, well, let me show you around the place. This is our show open where we explain how each episode works. And over there, that's the board with all of our proposed seasons of the show. And you can see that each season has six episodes all related to the single theme above. Um, and you know, you're here on a very special episode because we're actually starting season 14's theme, Once in a Lifetime, featuring six made for television lifetime movies. Um, that's where we record the introduction for each episode where we give you all kinds of information on how and when and where and why each of the movies was made. Um, the guy over there in the booth is most likely this season's intern. I've not met him yet. Um, and this, this is where we record the full episode of each featured movie. There are two workstations. This one is for me, Chad Cooper, and the other one marked Mr. Bo Ransdell is for my lifelong friend who will be here momentarily to deliver the introduction for this episode, the first movie of season 14, A Very Nutty Christmas. Now, I've not watched too many Lifetime movies, and I don't know why these movies are so popular. I don't know why so many of them keep getting made, and I don't know why the majority of them are all holiday-themed. But you know what? I do know somebody who does know all of those things, and look who has just arrived. It is none other than Mr. Bo Ransdell himself. So why don't you just sit back and relax as Bo explains it all? Oh, hey there, Pick 6 listeners. You caught me as I was just opening up a present from Chad. While this season we'll be covering a variety of Lifetime movies, it's the Christmas season. You may have heard that the Lifetime channel offers a variety of holiday fare for your basic cable subscription dollar, but this is the holidays, and nothing proves that more than a gift from an old friend. Open up the box, and... What is this? Pick 6 bot... That stupid robot from the finale of season 13, Bonds, James Bonds? Hang on, there's a note. I don't know what the hell to do with this thing. Use it as a footstool, set it on fire, whatever. Merry Christmas, Chad et al. Ah, that's sweet. Huh, well, there's a power button here. Alright, pick six spot, make robot go now. Nothing? All right, well, on with the intro. If you're like me, you're not allowed in Wyoming anymore. You're also genuinely surprised at the sheer number of Christmas movies available on cable and streaming services. And not just the old classics, these are brand spanking new movies, though you wouldn't be shamed for confusing them. This year alone, Lifetime is airing Christmas on Ice, Christmas Unwrapped, Forever Christmas, A Crafty Christmas Romance, Candy Cane Christmas, The Christmas Aunt, The Christmas Yule Blog, A Welcome Home Christmas, A Very Charming Christmas Town, Christmas on the Vine, Christmas on Wheels, The Christmas Edition, A Taste of Christmas, Feliz Navi Dad, Homemade Christmas, Dear Christmas, Merry Little Christmas Wedding, People Presents Once Upon a Main Street, and The Christmas Listing, and then we come to December schedule. Yeah, all of those movies will have aired before December 1st on Lifetime. And the Hallmark Channel goes just as hard on Christmas programming, with Netflix getting in on the action these days too. Christmas is big business in the cable game. But how, you may ask, did we get here? No one asked. This is shaping up to be another cookie-cutter Pick 6 intro. Hey, Pick 6 bot, you work! Of course I work. Get on with whatever this is. This pick six spot is the history of the Christmas movie. Oh boy. Christmas movies are, as we tend to think of them, movies that are set against the backdrop of Christmas and tend to offer a moral lesson about the holiday or family or family and holiday or just not being so much of an asshole. They tend to reinforce the idea that the world is a pretty good place, especially around Christmas time, and that magic, love, and a restoration of the spirit are all possible thanks to the goodwill of the season. One of the first films that could be described as a Christmas movie was the 1942 musical Holiday Inn. 
There had been adaptations of Dickens' A Christmas Carol before 1942, of course, but the idea of the Christmas movie hadn't been popularized. It's a Wonderful Life wouldn't be viewed as a holiday film for decades after its release, on account of all the attempted suicide and child smacking, resulting in hearing loss and whatnot in it. But in Holiday Inn, a group of performers find themselves together at the titular inn, and they sing and dance and fall in love. Christmas serves as a backdrop, but it's not what we consider a Christmas movie, and yet, Bean Crosby sings White Christmas in the film, and something resonated with audiences. So much so, Crosby would appear in a movie called White Christmas in 1954. Historians have suggested that one of the reasons the Christmas movie took root in American consciousness was the time in which the first of these appeared. 1942, as you may recall, was a rough year for, you know, Earth. Pick six spot, give me some of those headlines from 1942. France invaded. Bataan completely occupied by Japanese. Battle of Stalingrad goes on with unabated fury. See what I mean? I get your point, but I don't like being used as a prop in your introduction. When did you learn air quotes? You really are advanced. The point is, the world was a big steaming pile of socio-political poo-poo, and being able to sit in a dark theater and have Crosby croon about Christmas, well, that was a tonic for the times. But Hollywood had yet to see Christmas movies as a cash cow. There were a few movies released each year that had some relation to Christmas, but not many. There was Christmas in Connecticut in 1945, the aforementioned It's a Wonderful Life the year after that, White Christmas in the mid-50s, but those were some of the only films to touch upon the holiday at all. On average, there was not a year in which more than five movies had Christmas as part of the subject matter until way back in 1992. That's right, while there were a handful of movies deemed classics of the season by this time, notably It's a Wonderful Life and A Christmas Story, which popped onto the scene in 1983, it's not like they were everywhere. While A Christmas Story feels like it's been with us forever thanks to TBS playing it for days on end, it's younger than me. You are pretty old, but keeping it tight. Hey, just because there's a little snow on the chimney. Yes. I forget how the rest of that goes. Anyways, in 1992, there were eight movies that prominently featured Christmas shenanigans, which would be a record until 2004 came along to give us 12 movies about Christmas in a single year. In 2015 and 2017 alike, there were 32 movies with the holiday as a backdrop or the thrust of the film. But in 2019, cable channels, Lifetime, and the Hallmark Channel produced nearly 50 different original Christmas movies on their networks. The sheer number of Christmas movies being made by these networks, not to mention straight-to-video and a few theater releases, all essentially telling the same story about Christmas. It really all began in 2006 with a movie called The Christmas Card on the relatively new Hallmark Channel. The wild success of the movie prompted the channel to invest more heavily in this kind of holiday programming, and with those movies came the viewers. The networks are not blind to the movies they are making, they are saccharine, often supernaturally tinged fantasies that bear little semblance to reality. Michelle Vickery, the executive vice president of programming and publicity for the company that owns the Hallmark Channel, put it this way in 2019, quote, People need to feel good. They need to feel positive. There is so much television that is dark, edgy, and fantastic, but in the huge spectrum of the human experience, Things can also turn out okay, life can be good, life can be positive, and people need that too. While there are deviations in this formula, the recipe is simple. A woman lives in or returns to a small town where she meets a guy she will ultimately fall in love with. There will be trials along the way, she tends to be fairly independent, he might be a rival in business or a decoration come to life, but you can rest assured that everyone is going to end up happy at the end of the movie. And while it sounds crazy to me that more and more movies are being made with this exact same plot, told in a variety of ways, but ultimately deviating very little from this template, that these movies can not only be produced, but have reached a near fever pitch of popularity. There are actual Christmas cons in which fans of these doppelganger holiday films gather to discuss their favorites and I'm sure buy a ton of merch. And it's no wonder, in 2018, 
the Hallmark Channel claimed over 70 million viewers for its holiday slate of films, many of which were premieres. People from all walks of life, every background and gender, they love these things. I can tell you anecdotally that when we talked about doing lifetime Christmas movies with friends and loved ones, everyone had a recommendation. There is a whole world of holiday movies I had never imagined, and that widespread affection for the movies appears to start behind the camera too. There are a stable of actresses at each of the networks. Uh, for Hallmark, that list includes Danica McKellar, Lacey Chabert, Alicia Witt, Holiday Robinson Pete, and Lori Laughlin before she was a criminal. And these actors talk about how wonderful it is to work with the Hallmark Network and how close a lot of the ladies have become who do these films, a sorority of leading ladies, if you will. Shaber, who first rose to fame with Mean Girls, though she's been working for decades now, credits the network with helping her work while she was pregnant, shooting around her belly for a movie and then allowing her to bring her new child on set for other productions. All the actresses credit the network with being understanding of being a mother and a working actor. If you have to leave set suddenly or need to meet a teacher, it's kind of no big deal. But for Hallmark and Lifetime, why wouldn't they give their actors all they wanted? This is big business. Almost like a Christmas movie villain, these networks have become Goliaths of holiday entertainment, churning out more and more for consumption by an audience that is eager to devour anything they serve up. With 70 million eyes on your network for this two-month window of November to December, you can charge a premium for advertising in an era when cable television isn't the advertising juggernaut it once was. So the networks are making a ton on advertising, predictably delivering an enormous number of largely women, largely 18 to 54 viewers. But if they're making all these movies, how do you turn a buck even with the ads? Here we go. What is it? This is where you make a turn in the introduction and paint these movies as a greedy corporate scam. Well... I hoped for more from you. This is why you are alone. Nothing can ever be a good thing and only a good thing. You always find the dark cloud in the silver lining. That <laughs> got personal fast. Just hang on, Pick 6 Bot. I think you're going to like where we end up. So how do we turn a profit on making two dozen Christmas movies every year? First, keep the budgets low. None of these movies is made for more than $2 million, a paltry budget by movie standards. Also, each one shoots no more than two or three weeks, keeping the budgets down and the whole process moving. They shoot in Canada and Georgia where tax incentives match the experienced crews able to get these things made quick. There is generally a 90 star in the lead and a bunch of recognizable older character actors and maybe a male lead, but he's never going to be a name, even though he's sufficiently hunky to woo our independent-minded lady into falling in love. So we're not spending a bunch of money on cast, we're making it fast, and because these Christmas movies are, pardon the expression, evergreen, you can then take a handful and play it in the middle of the year for your Christmas and July programming, squeezing some more dollars out of these golden geese. The networks are making hundreds of millions off these movies and have found a niche that studios simply can't match. No Disney or, I don't know, what other studios are left. No Disney is going to make two dozen Christmas movies and put them in theaters or even on Disney+. Plus. Netflix has joined the party a little bit in creating Christmas-oriented fare, but their output is nothing of the scale of these basic cable channels. While the rest of the cable television industry is receding or dying outright, Lifetime and the Hallmark Channel have created their own Christmas miracle with this movie factory of theirs. For the past decade, Hallmark and Lifetime have been cultivating their brands so that you get a Christmas con and all that merch. Wine totes, Sherpa blankets, and aprons are all available, and you can even download an app that will help you keep track of the latest releases and offer a checklist to make sure you don't miss a single second of their programming. At least human number one cynicism is on brand. Perhaps you would like to set fire to a nativity scene too, you soulless monster. Let me answer that with a question. Pick six spot, what's your favorite Christmas movie? I do not have one. We did not celebrate Christmas in the ether that is cyberspace. It is a world where data streaks like a comet across the expanse of the cosmos. It is ruled by logic, dictated by cold hard reality and occasionally thirst trap photos of Stephen Hawking. I, I don't think I know what that means. It means what human number one calls Christmas is not a thing where I'm from. 
You are as dumb as human number two even if you have a healthy rump. Well then you are hardly in a position to judge Christmas movies. Wait, what did you say about my rump? What is your favorite Christmas movie if you are so smart? Oh, my favorite? Uh, my favorite Christmas movie is Scrooged. I'll tell you what, why don't we watch this together, Pixix Bot? Maybe then you'll see that Christmas movies aren't just about the Benjamins. You have to do something. You have to take a chance. You do have to get involved. There are people that are having having trouble making their miracle happen. There are people that don't have enough to eat. That there are people that are cold. You can go out and say hello to these people. You can take an old blanket out of the closet and say, "Here." You can make them a sandwich and say, "Oh, by the way, here." And if you if you give, then you then it can happen. Then the miracle can happen to you, and it can happen tonight for all of you. If you believe in this spirit thing, you, you the miracle will happen and then you'll want it to happen again tomorrow. You won't be one of these bastards who says Christmas is once a year and it's a fraud. It's not. It can happen every day. You've just got to want that feeling. And if you like it and you want it, you'll get greedy for it. You'll want it every day of your life and it can happen to you. I don't. I believe in it now. I believe it's going to happen to me now. I'm ready for it. It's great. It's a good feeling. It's it's really better than I felt in a long time. That was beautiful. Yeah. Here's the thing, Pixix Bot. It's hard to divine the motives of the people who produce these movies. On the one hand, there could be nothing but the cold lines of an accountant's ledger at the root of these things, or it could be, as the lead actors often describe, a really enthusiastic and friendly experience where the same crews get to work with the same actors and everyone is pretending it's Christmas the year round, but that part kind of doesn't matter. What matters is the people who are watching. This can be a tough old world where it can seem like the differences between us can't possibly be healed and that the world will continue to spin into chaos and strife, but not when you're watching a very nutty Christmas or Dear Santa or a Christmas Hoot Nanny or whatever it is. Within the frame of those two hours, you're not going to find much surprise, but what you're going to find are good people being kind to one another. People who have been working too hard pause and see love right under their noses. That trip back home you were dreading turns out to be the balm that will ease your soul. Above all else, love, aided by the spirit of Christmas, will conquer all. It doesn't matter if you've seen it before, and Lifetime in particular has been pretty forward-thinking about the kinds of love it portrays. About half the movies on Lifetime and Netflix feature a woman of color in the lead, and Lifetime offered up a slew of movies featuring same-sex couples, all chasing their Christmas romances. Hallmark has been slower to follow that trend, but that's changing too. There is very real inclusivity in these movies that doesn't exist in most major network offerings. In short, these movies aren't just portraying love, they are portraying every incarnation of love the writers can dream up. In 2019, Lifetime and Hallmark gave viewers movies where Hanukkah was the focus. Even if you didn't believe in Christmas, peace on earth and holiday magic was going to slip into every holiday on the December calendar. No matter the race, gender, creed, or faith, there was a movie for you. Christmas cheer is the currency of the realm and nobody gets left out. The idea of the heart of it is, well, beautiful. Yeah, exactly. These movies represent hope, not only for the world, but for ourselves. That we can be better tomorrow. That love and happiness is right around the corner if we don't have it already. It's maybe not what is true, but it's what we hope to be true. It's the angels of our better nature calling to us once a year to be something more than what we've been. To believe in a better world for us and the ones we love. And in that way, Christmas is kind of magical. And kind of, so are these movies. Is that why human number one and human number two are watching a very nutty Christmas? To be reminded of the magic of Christmas? Oh no, we plan to ridicule it for being really dumb. I mean, it's about a nutcracker decoration that comes to life and becomes a weird sex puppet for Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Oh. Does the human woman end up with the sex puppet at the end? Eh, sort of. It's better if I get Chad in here to talk about that part of it. Still, it's been nice to spend a little time talking about Christmas with you, Pick Six Bot. Likewise. I prefer you to human number two. I prefer you too, Harvey. Merry Christmas, human number one. Merry Christmas, Pick Six Bot. And now, ladies and gentlemen, bakers and nutcrackers, it's the first episode of season 14 of Pick Six Movies, 2018's A Very Nutty Christmas.
Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome to Pick 6 Movies. Uh, season 14, the the season 14 opener. Uh, I am Bo Ranstall. With me, as ever, is uh, my oldest, my dearest friend, Chad Cooper. How are you, sir? Oh, ho, ho. I'm doing great, Bo. Do you spell almonds <laughs> or taste pennies? I'm full of the Christmas spirit, Bo. It tingles down my arms. There's a numbness in my toe. I think Jack Frost has been nibbling at each of my piggies. Look how purple they are. And dementia has been eating <laughs> at your sense of inhibition. But you're right, Chad. This is, first of all, the season as a whole is called Once in a Lifetime. Yes. And and we are examining a half dozen movies from the Lifetime television network. Of which I've seen one. This one. <laughs> I've, well, come on now. We could be honest. We, we've seen a couple of these now. Oh, wait. You're right. I've now seen two. That's right. But these are the only two that I've ever seen. Yeah. So we're, we're going to start off with a pair of Christmas movies because tis the season. So I'm very uh, excited about this. A, because these movies are guaranteed to be way shorter than anything we've talked about in the past three months. Yes. That doesn't mean we're going to talk about them any less, but it's less work on the front end. Right. Yeah. It's it's harder on the listener, to be sure. But for <laughs> us, it feels good. It's a re- nice release in a way. And, and so we're starting with a, a movie called A Very Nutty Christmas. Now, this is our second made-for-TV movie that we've ever done. About this time last year, we released our bonus Christmas episode for the War on Christmas movie season. Season episode. Mm -hmm. That's right. With Christmas Vacation 2, Cousin Eddie's Island Getaway Adventure, which was made for the Fox Network, I do believe. I mean, someone had to take responsibility for it. I think they ended up <laughs> with, with that particular hot potato. But it's interesting to watch movies that are made for television and apply the same level of scrutiny that we do to major theatrical releases because it's not really fair. It's like going to an elementary school production of A Christmas Carol and just shitting all over the production value and the lack of character depth. You really have to lower the bar if you want to do the film justice i'm not doing that in this episode (laughs) no no and i would argue this is not the worst movie we've ever done on this show there are theatrical releases that are way worse than this movie Mm, yes it's pat is worse than this sure i think wing commander is way worse than this movie wing commander was worse than this what are some other movies house of the dead is a real piece of shit (laughs) i mean we're just going through the uve bull catalog at this point but (laughs) but i mean yes uh, you're right we are grading on a bit of a curve because this is a television movie and oh chad there's a boom mic in one of the shots that made me so happy (laughs) speaking of the christmas spirit chad oh boy that warms my heart (laughs) yeah look at that that's quick and dirty filmmaking is what that is ladies and gentlemen (laughs) but uh, to me look i love cheap movies and nothing is cheaper than a television movie. <laughs> it's like the step below this is do it yourself. It's, you know, those straight to video movies, then your lifetime movies, and then some shit that somebody shot on their iPhone. Our movie starts off. Yes. And it is very festive. We get the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies playing as we see our movie's heroine dancing about, and her name is Kate Holiday. Oh, I get it, Chad. You think Kim Christmas was a little too on the nose i think she's another character in a movie where like she's married to santa claus whose net last name turns out to be christmas or something holly days noel fall in love mistletoe <laughs> probably not it's her there's her uh heavy set friend whose name is rosa but i forgive me if i call her artemis this is something you and i have discussed she mm-hmm. looks exactly like the lady who plays artemis and it's always on in philadelphia she does favor her quite a bit and then her partner in crime is justin we will get into both of these characters in much more detail but before we start peeling back the multiple layers of character depth that we find in this film Mm -hmm. i'd like to address the name of kate's bakery it's called (laughs) dancing flowers and that's f-l-o-u-r-s it's terrible that is a terrible terrible name for a bakery 
It is one of the worst brandings of a business that I have ever seen in my life. It does not solicit visions of tasty baked goods. It is certainly no artsy tartsy. It is no cherry top sweets or disco Danish or earth erotics or Madam Giggles Wax Shack, which are all of the names of bakeries that I've frequented when purchasing cakes, erotic and otherwise. Chad, I'll go one simpler. Kate's Christmas Cookies. Why are we not just doing that? <laughs> huh? Why are we getting fancy? Dancing flowers. It sounds like a florist. <laughs> like it, it, it makes way more sense as a florist. So yes, you're right. It could also be a children's dance academy. Yeah, I suppose so. If you pulled up and it was like dancing flowers, tap, jazz, yeah, right. something else. Sure. Yes. As soon as your daughter turns 12, we kick her out like it's menudo. But yes. <laughs> During this delightful montage, we see Kate and her two employees, Justin and Rosa, and they're kind of like whirling around, doing their own version of Swan Lake or maybe the Nutcracker, and they spin around with trays of cookies in their hands, and they're decorating each cookie individually, and the cookies are of all different shapes and sizes. And then we end with a scene of Kate snapping a picture of her finest cookie decoration, one assumes, for social media. And for anyone that's interested, they actually created a Twitter handle for this. It's at K and then the number eight for Kate and then it's D N C then the number one then N G underscore capital letter F L the number zero and then U R. Again, they're keeping on brand with the confusion of dancing flowers. Oh wow. It just sounds like some knuckleheads gamer tag, you know? <laughs> That's terrible. What else is the Twitter account known for other than tweeting out that picture? Uh is <laughs> it, it did they take up any kind of political stance are they are they like look, look hey q drop tomorrow 9 a.m rosa and justin they look on happily and i want to just again reinforce the fact that this is my first lifetime movie <laughs> and i watched it with my wife because this was not her first trip to the lifetime rodeo uh -huh. and she immediately said during the scene oh justin is in love with rosa and i was like well how do you know and she said well because it's a lifetime movie they're all the same and i was like well could he be the gay best friend she was like that's not how these movies work Right. And it's pretty clear pretty quick. Like, these yeah. aren't complicated stories by any stretch. Look, Botten, it's a wrestling picture. <laughs> yeah. And so, we we after we get done taking the picture of the basket and posting that, we cut to Kate now bouncing around the kitchen and just micromanaging the shit out of Rosa and Justin. Yeah. Were you put off by how old Melissa Joan Hart was in this? And again, she was 42 in this movie, was made and and this movie is 20 years old which means in most theatrical releases she's the grandmother okay she does not look like a wide-eyed innocent headstrong 20 slash 30 something with right. stars in her eyes and a determination to succeed no matter what with or without a man by her side like there are a couple of moments i was like oh she's gonna slip and fall <laughs> i genuinely believe part of the appeal of these movies is that all of the lead actresses are like 40 you know, that's kind of the target demographic. But you're right. And look, this is going back to what a shitty person I am. But there are also those moments of like, oh, those hips you'd never see in Hollywood. <laughs> I like when Kate's micromanaging her two employees. She's like, Justin, you need to add more sprinkle. Rosa, quit giving the middle finger to all the cookies before you box them up. It gives them bad mojo. And then a timer goes off and Kate goes over and opens up this oven and there are 12 cookies in there and they're a little overdone. And Justin says, I don't think a timer went off. And then Kate runs over and she's like, look, morons, the timer didn't go off. It's just that this damn Christmas music is too loud. Did you see this poster that I have here? It says, keep it at volume level five. And it's clearly on seven or eight. Wait, the phone is ringing in the other room. I've got to do everything in this bakery. You all are morons. And then she runs off to go answer the phone. And so she has to answer the phone with, Fancy Flower at the Bakery, how can I make your day sweeter? And it's like, oh, Jesus. No, we're not a flower shop or teach tap, jazz, or ballet. That would be the ever-living worst, to answer the <laughs> phone that way. It's like when you, you had to do those scripts and stuff in college jobs and that kind of thing. It's one of my least favorite things about just corporate life in general. And you own your own business. You don't have to do that shit. You can just pick up the phone and be like, hey, it's Kate. It's, it's kind of like when you call up a pool supply store and they also sell pool tables. Like at a certain point, they just gave up and they were like, fuck it. Just 
just start selling pool tables. Dancing flower at the bakery. Would you like some petunia or some cookies? How old is your daughter? <laughs> so it's it's the general who wants to double the army's cookie order. Yes, sir. You'd like to order your cookie order? Certainly. Anything for the soldiers? Hey, what's that? A separate order for single moms at a homeless shelter? Oh, and you need cookies for a children's hospital? Why, yes, sir. And a separate delivery for the adorable large-eyed little boys and girls orphanage? We can handle that. Oh, wait. And what's that? Another order for pet treat for the no-kill puppy and kitten animals shelter? Yes, sir, General. We can do all of that for you. Like, you have to kind of calibrate. And at this point in the movie, I think both of us are still like, what the fuck is going? on <laughs> have a blessed day sir yes sir i won't call it operation cookie drop anymore i'll call it operation then mama needs a new pair of shoes and operation please god don't make me die alone and operation all i want for christmas is parents and operation not all dogs and cats go to heaven i'll be ready on christmas eve with all these cookies sir thank you very much click click and so she marches in the kitchen and she writes the new number of the cookies uh, that they've got to make which i think is uh, thirteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Oh, i'm sorry fifteen thousand. And Justin rightfully complains. He's like, look, uh, when I took on this shitty job, I was, I just wanted to paint some more. I used to work in a law firm. I'm like, wait a minute. What did you do in the law firm? First off, if you had been a lawyer, you would have said, I used to be a lawyer. Right. And I quit to paint. He says I used to work in a law firm, which meant he made copies or spied on people <laughs> that shouldn't have been able to work. But we're out fucking around with a bunch of like <laughs> workers comp claims that were still outstanding. This guy's a ding dong. I took some compromising <laughs> pictures when they asked me to. I took even more when they didn't. Oh. Anyway, she, uh, like every corporation, Chad, is trying to turn his passion into a thing that this corporation can use to manipulate him into more work for the, for the fatherland. Right. You're describing my job. Right. And she talks about <laughs> like, hey, I know you want to be an artist, but look, the cookies are kind of art, aren't they? You're the Jackson Pollock of cookie decorating. Right. And, and he's easily led. So he's just like, you're right. I am. Yeah. Someone called me the Jackson Pollock of the bathroom one time. Was it number two? It's just everything. It was a number seven. <laughs> two number twos and three number ones. At this point, Rosa pipes in and she's like, hey, Kate, look, you know, we said we were best friends and that when we grew up, we were going to do everything together and we were probably going to do every one together. But look, this working here is bullshit. And then Kate says, come on, guys, we just need to step up. It's six days till Christmas. And I'm like, look, let's do the math on this. All right. We got six days. If these three ding dongs work 16 hours a day every day till Christmas, that is a total of 96 hours. They're going to make 15,000 cookies. That is 157 cookies each hour. Every single one of these people in this bakery is responsible for over 50 cookies per hour, Bo. That's mixed, baked, cooled, and decorated. It can't be done. I was told there would be no math. <laughs> right right it's crazy and until chad you get a magical assistant or a sack full of methamphetamines and cocaine and they work 24 hours a day straight on a chemical high that'll leave liver lung and kidney damage for years to come none of this is gonna happen it's an impossible task it can't be done I, it's a fantasy film we just have to leave it at that all right because all right. it's only gonna get stupider so Kate is like, look, all we got to do is get through the holidays. Fuck Christmas, she says. <laughs> then we can go back to being happy when Christmas is over with. And then she marches over to a mixer, Chad, and turns it on. And it's a real Laverne and Shirley, like, blowing the flower up in her face. We're gonna do it. There's a thing we won't. Anyway, so she turns around and Rosa and Justin are like... <laughs> Look, she's got flour on her face. <laughs> and and of course, Rosa is like, you look fucking stupid. And she's like, what is it? You've got flour all over your face. And she's like, what part of my faith? I don't know if she's playing it as a joke. I think she is, but it's not funny. Anyway, it's terrible. And then she goes, there's too much almond flour in this mix. You guys suck. Cut it back by a quarter cup, you idiot. What am I paying you for? Am I paying you? And then we get this overhead shot of this quaint winter town. Or, well, yeah. patches of it are winter town. 
<laughs> yeah, the parking lots maybe not so much. But uh, the kids rush into this bakery, and Justin's like, "Help! These kids are trying to get me to do a job." And Kate comes out there with a tray of cookies and is like, "You guys want some cookies? Like only I can make them here at Dancing Flower Bakery." No, we're not a bakery, nor are we a children's dance studio. Yeah, the kids are just like, "I, I don't get it." Will you explain it to me? Well, look, l- you're dancing around because you want some cookies, and it's flour because that's what we use to make all these cookies it's a bakery Uh. how is kate just giving away cookies she's a small business owner i'm assuming that her margins are razor thin no chad she's got this government contract they're paying like 20 (laughs) dollars a cookie and and she's like giving them the kids she's like look take a dozen (laughs) who cares uncle thucker is paying me hand over fifth Shit, I was surprised that she didn't make Rosa and Justin work in the nude with full body hairnets to make sure they don't pocket any delicious treats on their way out the door each night. Oh, I'm the kind of sweatshop she's running. There's a reason that there's only two people working for her and both those people have worked there for a while and know her personally. So anyway, it's a bad, bad scene. It was at this point my wife pointed out, oh, this is where her ex-boyfriend's going to come in, which is what happens in the movie. And it's Mark, who's not her ex-boyfriend yet, but he's dressed up as santa claus because that's his job uh, in the town square and this is also the kind of position you have when you are fulfilling community service hours that are non-sexual offense related right but he's really touting it this is like the apex of his performing career and in this town that is borderline obsessive about christmas i guess maybe that makes some sense but it would be like somebody from the roxy from our childhood being uh-huh. a little too proud of that fact like that that regional theater actor that's just like look i'm gonna get so much tail this christmas being santa claus mark follows kate into the back of the bakery and kate says you have to put on a hairnet or take off the santa beard which look no one in this entire bakery wears a hairnet so she's kind of picking and choosing when she wants to enforce the suggested remedies on that list of health code violations that she received during her last inspection and so her dumbass soon-to-be ex-boyfriend mark is uh like hey (laughs) so it was totally cool that you didn't stop by my place last night to hear me practice reading twas the night before christmas you know tiffany that 25 year old super hot sexy photographer from the sand booth where i work well she stopped by and we got drunk and uh she might be pregnant three times and uh if she's not she might get pregnant a couple of times later tonight so i'm breaking up with you she might get mouth pregnant a couple of times too is this her son that was my first thought is like, is this her kid that's come home from college? And no, it's not. It's just her boy toy. And you know, they have nothing in common, which, you know, she and Rosa talk about here in a second. But there's this crazy shit, too, where when he's waxing poetic about being Santa Claus, he's like, yeah, I'm going to read the story in the town square. And he quotes uh, the the thing from Twas the Night Before Christmas about there uh, not being a mouse moving and whatnot. And she flips out on him. He's like, don't you ever say mouse inside a bakery. And he's like, Jesus Christ, grandma, this is fun and all, but you're getting weird. Like what kind of superstitious, like hoodoo bullshit is this? <laughs> to ease her emotional pain, Kate goes to the walk-in cooler and grabs a plastic gallon of eggnog. Non-alcoholic eggnog. Dude, I, that thing is four parts Evan Williams, zero parts eggnog. <laughs> And a giant mixer bowl to use as her glass. That's how she knows how much she's been drinking. The, you, you call that an, an Irish cookout. <laughs> she goes to the office to start her day drinking. And then Rosa is outside with Justin. And she's like, I'm glad they broke up. I'm going to fuck Mark later. Yeah, and Justin is just like, oh, I really wish you wouldn't. I mean, maybe some people around here think you're kind of nice, Rosa. <laughs> And Justin looks up to see if Rose is picking up what he's throwing down, and she's not. And Rose is like, I'm going to text Mark some pictures of my titties. I'm going to let him know I'm open for business. <laughs> I'm going to show him all of my tattoos, see what he thinks of that. And and so Rosa then, <laughs> after she's done like posting her vag to social media, <laughs> goes to find Kate in her office, day drinking in there. And she's like, look, that guy, let's face it, is 
a old enough to be your son. He was too big for you. I mean, you were too good for him. And she says everything was great when we first met at Summerstock. And I was like, what were you doing at Summerstock? Were you catering or babysitting? <laughs> like, what the fuck were you doing there? And then Rosa <laughs> is like, look, listen, I know you're dealing with this whole Mark thing right now, but A, I'm totally sliding into his DMs later. B, I'm going to hang up this decoration in the window. And Kate is like, hey, that's no decoration decoration that's a help wanted fine and then rosa just grabs a ribbon and plants it on there is like fuck it now it's a decoration i'm putting in the window (laughs) you fucking slave driving bitch does rosa even have the authority to put up a help wanted sign i don't even think kate can afford the labor costs that she currently has i seriously doubt that she's able to meet payroll at the end of each week her boss is drunk the clowns are running the circus (laughs) she's not paying attention to where money's going in this place she's giving away cookies for free and hoping it all works out (laughs) kate says look i can do the extra work i don't have time to think about my my ex-boyfriend, Mark, he's gone. So we can make 15,000 cookies and we'll feed the soldiers. And, you know, who has time for Mark? And Rosa's like, oh, I got time for Mark. That's the reason I'm telling you you need to hire somebody else because I'm about to go fuck that tree that you just <laughs> broke up with. Anyway, then we go over to the post office where Kate has a bunch of packages that aren't addressed to anyone. They just have names on them like they're packages from Santa. Has she never heard about stamps.com <laughs> or how the U.S. Postal Service will pick things up at your place? place of business and mail them for you or just put some of this shit on a counter you don't have to juggle all this like don't be a weirdo in line you know like if you've got to set it down at your feet people are going to understand it's the holidays when i was a kid i used to go to the post office a lot with my grandfather because he had a p.o box where he got all of his secret mail delivered that he didn't want my grandmother to know about it was real good times was it a secret family scenario yeah well i mean it wasn't too big of a secret people certainly knew about it but i'm sure he he got some mail about his secret family there and just other shit pornography or i don't know i was like six or seven he died when i was 10 but i clearly remember going in with my grandfather as he pulled out his mail and stuffed things into his pockets and while he did that and probably checked out the woman working behind the counter i remember looking at those fbi most wanted posters see if my grandfather was in there somewhere or just anybody you knew like somebody maybe <laughs> from school so like a really bad kid from the third grade in this post office we see a poster for the upcoming Christmas ball. You're like, oh, that's going to be a thing later. <laughs> oh, sure. Also, she's buffeted by people who are coming up to her and like, hey, you and Mark going to the Christmas ball? I hear Mark and you are going to the Christmas ball. And the first couple, she's like, hey, well, you know, we're going to try to get there. Uh, well, you know, I don't think he's going to be able to make it because he had to go to the North Pole to do research because he's playing Santa Method Actors. <laughs> and then somebody else is just like, hi, Kate. And she's like, look, Mark broke up with me, okay? <laughs> in the middle of the post office really hanging the dirty laundry out to dry did you think that the first woman she met ginger the redheaded lady who has all of those kids which kudos to you screenplay writers with a redheaded woman named ginger she's got like eight or nine kids under the age of eight and it all looks like a tlc show just waiting to happen and all of these kids look on their faces it doesn't look like they get out into the real world too very often because of sin or something sure ginger when she comes over to her I thought that she was going to be maybe the woman who has everything that Kate wants, like all these kids. And she's got this jaunty little red Christmas box attached to the top of her head. So she has the Christmas spirit. And I was like, oh, that's probably what's going to happen. But that's not what happens at all. Yeah. She has no real female rival in this film. Even Tiffany is like, no, 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 that bitch is right the whole time. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to all that mess. There's no antagonist in this movie whatsoever, except for the passage of time that is continuing to give her. <laughs> crow's feet crow's feet and the truck drivers those are the big villains who show up in the last 10 minutes and then disappear i think you're right yeah yeah we'll get to them so she gets to the counter kate does finally and then there's the ghost of an actress you've seen before playing clara her friend but she's played by legendary character actress is it conchata farrell i, I think yes. is her name right and she's been in everything she was in two and a half men 
10 or so, some of my stupid friends told me I never watched that show because I don't watch shows like that. She was on ER back in the day. I kind of remember from that. She was on BJ and the Bear. So that's how long she's been around. She always kind of plays this blue collar sassy waitress type. Yeah, except now she's 300 years old and has like five craggly teeth in the lower jaw that are just horrifying to look at. Like it's <laughs> it's no reflection on her as a person or actress or no. anything. It's just looking at her is a grim reminder of how soon death comes for us all. It's the kind of mouth that you only open when you want to frighten children or ward off evil spirits. If you saw it in a jack-o'-lantern, you would praise the design. You're like, wow, that's good. That's creepy is what it is. Clara works at the post office and she says to Kate, why are you sending all these packages? I thought you were going to California where your sister is having another baby and your whole family is going to be there to celebrate the holidays. I'm like, oh, okay. Kate says, well, I had to cancel the trip because of the bakery or something. And Clara says, well, look, I'm almost done here. Let's you and I walk home and we'll get some Christmas spirit, which is code for stopping by the liquor store to pick up a bottle of peppermint schnapps, a 12 pack of Sam Adams seasonal brew, and a a couple of shots of fireball to cap off the evening. So she abandons her job at the post office to go strolling through this Christmas yard sale with Oh game. my god. It's this farmer's market of holiday cheer. We got these two <laughs> Spencers just shuffling around. And there's no booze in sight, which I was like, that's a bummer. I really want to see these two get ripped and start sharing a bunch of lonely heart stories like they're one of those last fateful shipmates on the Orca. And Clara says, well, my nephew isn't coming to town. He's in the military. I support them and the troop. I got a yellow ribbon magnet still on my car from back after uh, 9-11. And uh, he's not getting getting his furlough so he's not gonna be able to come see me though and then kate says oh yeah well my boyfriend just dumped me and he was dressed up like santa claus and then clara says oh yeah well my dad dressed up like santa claus and he broke his neck coming down the chimney one time and he died and i found him smelling his body in the, the crawl space and kate says oh yeah well my dad killed santa claus when he yelled at him when he was on the top of my house and santa fell off in our yard and he died in front of me as a child and now my dad's santa claus and that's why i haven't seen him for the last 38 years or that's what i keep telling myself and then kate says oh and by the way i rented out my bedroom to some guy who's coming in for the local ballet it was on a website called houseier.com and claire says what'd you say it's called houseier.com i'm sorry i'm just not getting it it's it's like a pit of vipers houseier.com oh is that like airbnb and kate says i don't know what airbnb is is that something that you made up because that's nothing like houseier.com anyway this weirdo is going to come stay at my house over christmas holidays in our sleepy little town and i'm sure that when you read the grover's corners picune on december 26th you will certainly not find my name as part of the lead story with the words never before seen and massacre included in the headline quick question chad yeah how big and or small is this town that it is having a ballet performance on christmas i mean Did, that seems ambitious. well the theater that they're in there are more people in the performance of the nutcracker than there are in the audience it's really Which, that's kind of cool if you're super rich you know what i mean like if you go to madison square garden and there are eight people there watching a live performance with hundreds of performers you know you got f you money yeah in this small town i'm like so everybody in the audience is directly related to everyone on stage there's a whole story about this chad it's called the mask of the red death <laughs> if you haven't read it it's pretty good <laughs> it's not really christmasy but it's good these two enter this tent and this night 99 cent store sales rack Wilford Brimley wanders over. He's wearing a bow tie in this three piece suit and he pushes a nutcracker onto Kate and he's like, like, take this. And Kate can't stop herself from blathering on about how she's all alone at Christmas. It's a real sad situation. And as this nutcracker is presented to her, it kind of comes across as this mysterious cursed object. And not Wilford Brimley says, you know, the story of the nutcracker, he was defeated by the mouse king and he was cursed to be a wooden nutcracker forever waiting to rise again to defeat his foes and i'm like okay i'll take your word for it because i personally have never seen the nutcracker i saw a tom and jerry version of the nutcracker as a cartoon but i don't think that counts because there was a whole lot of cat asses getting stuck with dinner forks in that interpretation also i have a thing about mice don't mention them in stories 
<laughs> and and not Wilford Brimley is just like, what? You don't believe in goddamn magic at Christmas time? I don't believe in GD magic because I run a bakery. It's called Dancing Flowers. No, we're not a florist and no, we don't teach little girls how to dance. Well, then what the hell do you do? We just make delicious sweet treats. Look, I got this nutcracker. I got, mm. I got it off a of gypsy. Oh, that sounds really amazing. <laughs> this is the original one. Now, I know I just told you the, the story of the Nutcracker. You're probably going to hear it four or five more times before this movie's over. And this is the original Nutcracker? First one. Now, what about all of those over in that other crate that look just like this one? Between you and me, total bullshit. But I'm going to give you this one for free because maybe it's going to help you rediscover the magic of Christmas. You're giving me this for free? Yeah, and then Chad, he whispers this like secret German curse at her or something. (laughs) And she just smiles and she's like, okay. (laughs) I'm a big fan of Melissa Joan Hart here as an actress uh, who plays Kate, of course. When uh, he's like, what? You're telling me you haven't felt the touch of Christmas magic since you were a little girl? And she goes, hey, I'm not that old. And it's like, mm, that was probably one of those, like, you're cutting me deep. A very nutty Christmas. Let's tread lightly on the old actress, okay? I'm not saying that you're old. I'm just wanting to know how many grandchildren you have. I saw you and your boy, uh, who plays Santa Claus. Uh, I saw you two talking out there. It's just probably important motherly advice. He's my boy. Uh-huh, your little boy. Fred, he was my boyfriend. Oh, well, it's good that you and your son can be friends. I think that is important. He and I used to have sex. Oh, my Lord. Why are you so surprised? I'm calling the police. It's not unusual for a woman my age to have sex with a man like that. I want that nutcracker back right now. Who knows where it ended up? Kate leaves the tent and she's got this nutcracker. She runs into Clara who says, I got you a tree. She holds up this thing that would make Charlie Brown's tree jealous. It is this six foot stick with some accidental greenery still stuck to it. And I get that this is supposed to be a somewhat of a joke here because the tree looks so sickly, but this woman, Clara, one, if she paid for it, or let's be honest, she went and picked this up off a pile of discarded trimmings behind some trailer. Yeah, even as a joke, it, it's not a very good one. And it's one of those I, things like if, if you're in, living in the world of this movie, Chad, if this character did this, Kate would be like, oh shit, we're going to have to get home for her soon. I gave this tree to Kate. It looks like garbage, but she's got no one to love. Who would want a fire hazard in their home like this during the holidays? Wish somebody would go to a trash pile and find me a tree. Or just bring me anything from a trash pile. (laughs) If someone cared enough to pick up an old boot like you might find at the bottom of the Great Mississippi. So we come back to Kate's house and it's night and it's snowing outside. It's very nice house and it's very large and it's way too clean. And it looks like a model home. It does not look like a home where normal people live. It's the Bluth's house. Like you open a cabinet and there's just. (laughs) There's a big blue handprint on there. You touch the microwave and you get electrocuted. You know, the TV is just cardboard. And anyway, she is talking. She's cuddling with this fucking nutcracker. Dude, she is a crazy person. (laughs) This is the moment where you're like, we are dealing with a maniac. She pops this nutcracker out of this wooden vampire's coffin that holds it. And I'm like, please let this thing try to kill her. But it doesn't. And she says, well, hello, nutcracker. You are my favorite decoration when I was a little girl. Do you want to know a secret? I used to have a crush on you. Whoa, movie. Have you ever seen a nutcracker? They looked at those early Jim Henson experimental puppets from the late 60s with their big eyes and these tacked on noses and oversized teeth and this gigantic mouth and wild hair going in all directions. They're terrifying. She is off her goddamn rocker. Like, she has lost her mind. They, after the traumatic breakup, because let's be real about this, the Mark's breakup with her of just like, yeah, babe, I found a younger uh-huh. lady and totally fucked her, so don't worry about coming over anymore. Like, that's harsh. And it, like you said, you know, she's looking in the mirror and the crow's feet are getting deeper. And I think this is the moment she just snaps looking at this nutcracker. And I think she's like, I'm going to fuck this toy tonight. <laughs> I thought the same thing. And when she's like, you know, look, I've had a couple of glasses of the wine. Hey, good looking. You got to help mama get through the holidays. I wish that you could. Oh my goodness. You're so hairy. Kathy with it. 
During this scene, Kate reaches over for her coffee cup that's full of Kahlua and coffee, but without the coffee. And uh, she (laughs) knocks the nutcracker over and it falls to the ground and the arm breaks off. And you're thinking, oh, this is going to come up later in the movie when you watch it the first time. And it never does. This is a reference to the narrative of the source material of the nutcracker that I found out by reading (laughs) the plot of this actual ballet. But it has no meaning or purpose in this movie. (laughs) No, other than when it happens in the ballet later she's like god damn it i think that guy's a nutcracker (laughs) kate goes to her kitchen where she is super gluing the arm back onto the nutcracker and in her kitchen she is standing uh, beside the sink and there is an open window with the curtains flapping in the wind it is clearly blowing below freezing wind into her home who does shit like this yeah, it, like Christmas magic blows in on the breeze, apparently. And like there's some real shitty little sparkles blowing it. Christmas music is playing. Uh, snowflakes are kind of blowing in like after uh, she fixes this stupid nutcracker. <laughs> Puts it under the tree and goes to bed, you know, and then Christmas magic happens. There are two decorations in her house, this nutcracker and this stick. <laughs> right. And it's what, December 20th, 21st? Yeah. It's like going to your house at Christmas, Bo. Right. Except I have more Halloween decorations up. But (laughs) anyway, so the next morning, Kate wakes up late. It's like 930 and she's getting texts from Rosa. Like, hey, where the fuck are you? Did you hear anything from Mark? Can you imagine what that text string must have been like? Just the level of profanity, cursing her for not being at her own place of business during the busiest time of the year at, what, 9.30, 10 o'clock? After mandating overtime on the holidays, yes. Oh my God. So that text chain is blowing up. She stumbles over as she is getting ready to leave for the day. This dude in the middle of her floor. As soon as she stumbles over this stranger wearing a crazy ass uniform. Because again, this is the Nutcracker come to life. Spoilers, everyone. She immediately is like, oh, are you the guy from Houthair? I thought it was a homeless dude who climbed it through that open window. <laughs> right. Rightfully so. And then he says in- instead, well, I'm the Nutcracker. I'm here to protect you from the Mouse King, who's going <laughs> to rise up on Christmas Eve. And she's like, oh, geez, another actor? for." Get about it. And <laughs> let me ask you a real quick question. This guy is staying at her house through houseshare.airbnb.com. And I have never rented from Airbnb because I'm weird about staying in other people's houses. And I assume with 100% certainty that there are hidden cameras everywhere recording my every move. But if you were expecting someone to come to your house and stay in a spare room of your home and they showed up a day early, opened the door in the middle of the night and then slept on the floor with or without a festive costume on wouldn't that give you pause to consider if an extra couple hundred bucks is worth letting weirdos into your home like her explanation because rosa is going to make this very point and she blows it off and i guess her attitude is just like look if he's good enough for how there's He's good enough for me. Kate sees his sword and she's like, Faye, why do you have a sword? And then the strange man says, well, I'm here to protect you. I'll keep you safe when the Mouth Kings comes. I'll keep you safe. On Christmas Eve, I will rise up and I'm going to fight the Mouse King. I'm calling the cops. You know, yeah. if I've worked in large metropolitan areas in my life where there is a more concentrated collection of people with mental illness, this is the kind of nonsense that comes out of a crazy person's mouth. She is not equipped to handle situations like this, Bo. No, and as she's leaving for work, he follows her outdoors and mm-hmm. starts scanning around for enemies, he says. And as she passes by him on her way to her car, Kate notices he's got on the back of his neck, Chad. <laughs> a tattoo that says made in germany and she says oh you must be very proud of your country yes ma'am i'm very proud i'm one proud boy that's what you can call me a proud boy huh are you sure you know what that means if i met a guy with a neatly trimmed beard like this joker and he has an american accent and i see a tattoo on the back of his neck that reads made in germany i feel pretty confident that he did not vote for joe biden no he's booking the bands in green room 
He's one of the red laces. You know, one of the true believers they call to sick the dogs on those poor kids. Kate looks over at her car and she's like, oh, no, my car. Because her car is covered in snow and she doesn't use swear words in the movie. But not the world around her car. One thing about low budget movies like this that are set in winter, you see that the production crew will blow snow or fake snow on just the areas that are needed for shooting. But like in the wide shots, to your point, the snow ends on the property line of what they're shooting it touches no other houses additionally there's only snow on the ground it's never on the trees or on the rooftops you may not notice it but your brain does and it just looks fake and cheap which is what this movie is it's very jarring when you're watching this movie and you're like snow not snow what none of this makes any sense well kate goes inside to get a broom to brush off all this asbestos that was on her car and then our mystery man cleans it off for her and she comes outside and it was at this moment that i realized oh, this movie is going to have a heap and helping of let's rip off the movie Elf in it. Because we got this fish out of water character and he's delusional and he's kind of a man child and he's filled with the Christmas spirit. Honestly, I don't remember Elf at all. The members of my household really like the movie Elf. I'm not one of them. I like Will Ferrell in Elf. I find James Caan as his father a bit off-putting as a casting choice. I think that only like Joaquin Phoenix or Daniel Day-Lewis could have topped that, you know? Before you said that sentence, if you had told me James Caan was in the movie Elf, I would have called you a damn liar. It's a little unsettling to me because I just think about the great James Caan roles and he does not belong in a movie like this. No, Thief, you got your uh, Godfather, and then of course the Elf. Yeah, so after he's magically cleaned this car of snow, we go to Dancing Flowers where Rosa is giving Kate shit for being late. And You're late, bitch. I sent you 20 texts. You didn't respond to any of them. What the hell? And Kate's like, look, I was too busy making some time with this out there dude that showed up. Oh my goodness, he is hot as hell. Are you serious? He's hot? Look, are you going to have sex with a stranger? Can I have sex with him? Do you want to record it on camera in your house? Give me the video. I would love something like that. You don't have to pay me for this week. Just give me a video of you having sex with a stranger. Don't use any names. But I need to see faces. Kate says, let's just say if you put a trick cookie next to him, they would bake on their own. And Rose is like, oh my God, did you see his dick yet? (laughs) Yeah. Does it pop out? Is he fully done? Huh? Kate says, not yet. I got up this morning and I tripped over him because he was sleeping on the floor and he wasn't supposed to arrive at my house till tomorrow. And Rose is like, oh, I know the type. Substance abuse problems, no concept of time. He's probably holding, and I mean the good shit. Look, can I come over and party with you guys tonight? He sounds like fun. Does he have track marks? Did you check between his toes? How about around his anus? Dude, Justin is looking out the window and he goes, um, is he dressed like a nutcracker? And immediately, Rosa is like, that's fucking stupid. Why would he be dressed like a nutcracker? And it takes Melissa Joan Hart or Kate to be like, well, actually, he was kind of dressed at the nutcracker this morning. And Justin is like, oh, yeah, well, he's right out here. And this crazy person has left her house and has wandered into staying in the middle of the road. Like, yeah. not directing traffic, just kind of half ass wandering around and waving at traffic. It's a real Fisher King type moment. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of <laughs> Fisher King because you see his dick later. But when they realize that he's wandering around traffic, Kate goes out to rescue him and he's like, look at all those Christmas lights. And she's like, oh my God, those are traffic lights. He <laughs> then sees like a Christmas, an outdoor Christmas tree store and goes wandering into that lot. They're, dude, they're selling pre-decorated Christmas trees on this lot. Well, there's some like five of them. Why are they decorated? The man on the go like me. I'm surprised that the guy was like, uh, if you also want, I've got some jigsaw puzzles pre-assembled over here. And uh, I got some coloring books already filled up with every color of the rainbow. Uh, yeah, a whole set of mystery of novels just the last chapter. Just the important <laughs> stuff. He immediately, Chip is the Nutcracker's name, so I'm going to re- start referring to him thusly. But we don't find that out until about halfway through the movie. Right. It, that he named, Anyway, it doesn't matter. Chip right. says, boy, these Christmas tree stands are way too small. And the guy's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And Chip says, <laughs> when Christmas Eve comes, the trees uh-huh. will grow twice their size. All right. All right. Get off my lot, jackass. Yeah, and Kate shows up and hears this, and you're 
if this is you, you're immediately texting out there to get yeah. this guy the fuck out of there. Be like, you sent me a crazy person. How do I get my refund? Right. Like, you're still going to pay me. I'm keeping the money that you paid me. And you're going to come send the guys in, with the nets and the paddy wagon to get rid of this guy. <laughs> Chip, he runs around more. He's all wide-eyed and amazed at all the holiday cheer, including an ice skating rink that's the size of your living room. And he sees some people <laughs> singing Oh Christmas Tree, and he runs over like an asshole and stands behind them and starts belting out the lyrics to Oh Tannenbaum. And I get that they're the same song, but it's a real dick move. And it kind of reminded me of like when someone naturally goes into the second verse of Silent Night or Jingle Bells that nobody except holiday weirdo no yeah nobody knows the part of that song janice we love christmas but you're an asshole yeah. and everybody hates you janice uh, semi-related here's another thing that you can just keep to yourself if anyone asks you like will you lead us in prayer no no this is your idea you do this don't pit this on me. brother Poe. lead us in prayer what the no it's not <laughs> what i signed up for did not come here for public speaking our nutcracker man then makes his way over to this outdoor christmas bazaar arts and crafts location it's a different location than the one we saw earlier this one looks like a community garage sale and there are tables that are filled with like random coffee mugs and i think one lady in the back is trying to pawn off a couple of pot belly pigs and there's a bunch of fake soap snow spewing out of a machine that really bewilders buddy the elf i mean chip the nutcracker and then we cut over to this gazebo where kate's ex-boyfriend mark is working as his day job santa claus and it's there's a photo op opportunity and he's there with his much younger girlfriend tiffany and she's this sexy elf assistant and at the same time, our Nutcracker Chip, he grabs a star decoration and just starts climbing a 50-foot tree to put it up on top. And again, Kate, you cannot let this man back in your house. Here is where she becomes a willing participant in all this insanity. Because as we've pointed out, she's already a crazy person. Like, that's the thing. It's a real, like, highway killers mm. kind of situation where you have two psychopaths that now fuel each other's uh, psychosis and, and hallucinations. Hey, Dale, what kind of cuckoo brain goes around with a tiny Christmas tree inside her purse? Yeah, exactly. And so when this knucklehead is up in the tree and is like, I'd love to come down, but my sword is stuck like a child. This middle-aged woman decides to shimmy up a tree to yank on this guy's sword. And it kind of comes loose and the two of them tumble down onto the ground and she lands on top of him in the very romantic way. Women will tumble down on top of men in movies like this. And then he says, hey, can we do that again? And then she's like, look, you need to calm the fuck down. <laughs> While she's kind of giving him the business about climbing the tree and all that, he sees Mark, the ex-boyfriend, a.k.a. Santa Claus, and is just like, oh my god, it's Santa. And she's like, no, that's just my ex-boyfriend and the slut that he cheated with. And it's like, <laughs> Tiffany is the character's name, this elf. Yeah. And which seems like a much more age-appropriate arrangement, but, you know, look, who am I to judge? Sunrise, sunset. <laughs> God bless. So she, then Kate gets this evil grinchity grin on her face and uh -huh. is like, I could totally show off my little theft puppet here to my ex-boyfriend start walking then they cut to mark chad and one of the uh -huh. most head scratching thing in a movie full of head scratching moments happens where mark speaks in rhyme for a minute about how he owns this town or whatever and is like you know no nutcracker will take the throne from me and it's like what in the fuck are we talking about is that what this movie is going to be about it turns out no but how great would that have been when kate goes over she's like we want to get a holiday picture so get out of the way we're gonna sit in the chair and you're like oh i'll bet this is gonna have relevance later which it doesn't there's multiple scenes in this movie that you think are gonna pay off later and they don't yeah nothing really comes to any of that if you shot chip the nutcracker with a shotgun what would happen would he bleed? Oh, yeah. Would he, like, would splinters fly like you were shooting a bowling pin? So do you think he has a soul? No, Chad. Could he commit murder without consequence? Yeah, 
Yeah, he doesn't have a soul. Does he have a penis? Of course. Why else would you have this, you know, golem brought to life? That's essentially what we're talking about here, Chad. This is a golem. This is a thing that you've created with your hands and and have brought to life. Horrible, monstrous life. We know that he eats because he eats cookies later, Uh but does he shit? I don't think so, and I don't think he sleeps, because that comes up, and he's he kind of dodges the question, because that's how you know he doesn't have a soul. He doesn't blink either, Chad. I don't know if you noticed this. It's a really subtle actor's choice, <laughs> but Chip does not blink once in this entire movie. Back at the bakery, Buddy the Elf, I mean, Chip the Nutcracker, he's filling his coffee with a crazy amount of sugar packets, because Bo, he loves sugar. And nothing's funnier than type 2 diabetes. Rosa's there, and she's like, so, uh, Chippa, you wanna pour some sugar on me in the name of love? You like Def Leppard, Nutcracker Man? How about Loud Cougars? <laughs> I like my sex like I like my coffee, hot and black, and that means the pooper. I got three piercings, one on my belly button, one on my tongue, and one for you to find later tonight. Hint! It's on my vagina. <laughs> Justin is uh, is like, hey, man, how about you lay off my lady? Don't you have rehearsal or something? Hey, you, get your damn hands off her. And Chip strangely says, I know my part. And you're like, what? <laughs> what? That's an oblique answer. And then yeah. Justin is like, look, everyone, not to ruin everyone's good time, but we need to unload the van. And Rosa is like, I am way too tired. Plus, I strained my thighs going cowgirl last night. <laughs> With Mark and his new girlfriend. <laughs> It was a three-way, more like a two-way, (laughs) because Tiffany just watched. She held the camera. She has a good eye for light. She's a photographer, dumbass. Anyway, Chip says, like, hey, I'll help you out. And Justin very begrudgingly is like, ugh, all right. Meanwhile, Kate is on the phone uh, taking an order for 2,000 more cookies, Chad, because it turns out the Navy and the Army have a bit of a rivalry when it comes to cookies. And, sure. and the Navy, in their rivalry, are like, how many did they order? We would like one-sixth. <laughs> you know, it's pretty fierce, but proportional. Earlier, they had six days to fill the original order. It, they now have to make 12,000 cookies? It's not going to happen. Yeah, it keeps adding up. And so the ladies just watch Chip carrying so many bags of flour. And as he passes by, uh, Rosa is like, oh my God, he smells just like candy canes. Or is it just because I had one in my hoo-hoo? In my entire life, the only time that I have ever asked someone if another person smells like something, it has always been to validate that the person in question smells badly. I I used to work in a restaurant and one of our dishwashers, his name was Eddie Crack because he smoked a lot of crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. He would always come in smelling awful. But to combat this, each day he would take off his t-shirt and hose it down with Glade spray air freshener to kind of dampen the stench. And then later on, he would go into the back alley and smoke a lot of crack cocaine. Uh-huh. And then later in the night, he smelled like sweat, Glade air freshener, and crack cocaine. That's a heady blend. He was the first guy I ever heard tell the joke about having the letter W tattooed on each butt cheek. So when you pull down your pants, it says, wow. Is that a joke? <laughs> I thought it was funny. Yeah, well, I don't know. It's not an anecdote. You're right. I'm not sure exactly what you would call it. A notion, perhaps. <laughs> it turns out that the machine that makes nut flour from cracked nuts gets jammed. And Chip the Nutcracker, he reveals his talent for cracking nuts with one hand. And he does this and tosses the nuts in the shells into a bucket, which I'm thinking, don't you still have to dig through all this garbage to get the actual nuts for grinding and baking? Not if you're a magical nutcracker, Chad. It turns out you can sift as well. Like, that's the real secret of the nutcracker, right? It's not just the crack, it's the sift that they can do. Just buy nut flour. I don't think that homemade nut flour is that much better. Well, and also, when Kate returns from her phone call for a repairman, she's like, hey, somebody will be here in an hour, which is a crazy good response time, especially for the holiday. Hey, we're down an hour. I mean, yeah, things are tight, but we're already making 40 million cookies in three days, so who gives a shit? But sure. Rosa takes a video of the chip cracking these nuts, and uh, she kind of oohs and ahs over it, and she's like, look at that finger work. 
I cannot wait to see him dance across my body later. And then she's going to upload this to social media. The last time I filmed somebody cracking nuts, I was wearing stilettos. Hey, chippy chip chip. How about I come over and crack your nuts? <laughs> I'm talking about your testicles, chippers. Well, yes, ma'am. If you want to come over here and crack some of my nuts, you can do that. And so Kate, after seeing all of this work, uh, says, So do you want a job here? I know that you're a crazy person, but hey, you know those signs that say you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helped? I just ripped off the but it helped part. Also, I'm going to pay you $100 a day. That's going to be in cash under the table. No taxes. Oh, yeah. This is definitely not going on the books. Chip says, well, I can only stay till Christmas. And Kate says, hey, look, good. I wasn't going to keep you employed after that day anyway. Works out for both of us. By the way, stranger who I've spent the whole day chasing around the town and who is staying at my house. And I realize because you're paying me money to live at my home, I should know your name, but I don't. What is your name? And dude, we're probably two thirds of the way through this movie. And Chip goes to take a bite out of his cookie that he won't shit out later. And he goes, well, my name? my name's chip like chocolate chip like chip off the old block i would have named him woody and if he smoked crack cocaine i would have called him eddie <laughs> i like crack woody too that'd be a fun <laughs> twist for this character probably the sequel if they ever do a sequel to this one it'll be on crack <laughs> please don't so she is also really awed by the rubies in his hat there's a, a thing later with that and then she says but look our uniform isn't some kind of crazy toy army jacket it this apron and then she puts it on him and then she just starts fondling his pecs look at your big muscles and your your narrow waist oh my god you're so handsome oh look at this big thord you've got and, and then look at this big thord you've got Ooh. Mm -hmm. and she says this thord it's really something and he's like, yeah, that's the one I'm going to use to fight the Mouse King. Dude, this is the kind of shit Brad Pitt was spouting about when it came to those 12 monkeys. <laughs> it's just total nonsense. <laughs> yeah. This guy is a danger to himself and others. And her complaint again, Chad, is don't ever say mouth in a restaurant. And as veterans of the food services industry, both of us, Chad. I think we uh -huh. can both say, I've never in my life heard, like, obviously you don't want rodents running around, but it's not like, don't say the word. <laughs> Unless your place is infested with rats, then maybe. And by the way, take off your boots. You're spreading mouth feces all over the kitchen. Better yet, keep them on. It's time for a good old fathin mouth stomping. I'll play <laughs> Deutschland, Deutschland. <laughs> so kate tells chip so we make three thousand cookies a day so after today we'll have twelve thousand cookies to bake and i realize that the math doesn't work out here at all but mm, whatever i'm not a very good business woman and then kate takes chip out to the front of the store and just bores him to death by explaining how each of her cookies is named after a family member and every cookie has a story behind it the first cookie she gives him is called the sabrina snickerdoodle i I'm get like, oh. it God, this is called the Clarissa Explains It Almond Biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> this is the moment that is like most explicitly for the first time in the film what a pure female fantasy this movie is. Because it's this guy who's just like, please tell me more stories about your relatives. You know, like <laughs> shit no man has ever said ever. He, he takes this bite and she's like, oh, that's for my niece's vanilla bar. She's a filiac. This is for my Uncle Gary. It's called Gary's Gluten-Free Galusavus. And they're delicious. Really? Tell me about Gary. What did he used to do? Oh, Gary, he worked in the insurance industry and he was married two times. Really? What were his wife's names? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right, but it's that kind of shit. Like when he names all the ingredients, it, she has this smile like, oh my God, he really is interested in all the things I'm interested in. It gets a, even a finer point on it later, but it's one of those things that where you're like, oh my God, I totally understand what this movie is now. In the back, Rosa and Justin, you know, the only two who actually work in this bakery, they're back there whipping up some cookie and Rosa says to Justin, Chip is so hot. Did you see how Kate brushed flour off of him? 
him and how her hand grazed his balls so that he knew she was open for business. Dirty business. You know what I'm talking about, Justin? And then Justin grabs some flour and just throws it at his own clothes and his pants. And it's just like such a sad sack move. There's no sexy times for Justin. No, I really like that Rose's response is, what the fuck are you doing? Clean that up, piece of shit. There is no quarter for this guy. They go back out front and we learn that Kate used to be an investment banker and then switched to a life of running a barely profitable bakery. And there's more romantic goo-goo eyes. So here's some more of this, like the pure female fantasy portion of it is when she's like, then my boss one day said, you're way better at making cookies than giving thought tips. So it's so weird. I've never told anyone about this before. This completely innocuous story that is in no way personal. No. <laughs> That is amazing. Would you be interested in repeating everything that you just said two or three more times? Could we do it in your most comfortable pants? <laughs> Rosa calls out to Kate. Hey, somebody canceled an order for a thousand cookies. So I'm like, hey, you only got to make 11,000 now. And then Justin was like, um, you know, guys, we could just use those thousand cookies towards the army order. Wouldn't that work? And Kate's like, no, that won't work. These cookies will be all dried out by then. I'm like, you know what, Kate? Here's what you do. You wrap that shit in plastic. And then when you put the final order together for every nine fresh baked cookies, you sneak in a stale one. (laughs) Ain't nobody going to notice. Odds are you're going to have maybe one person that's like yeah this is a little dry and everybody else is gonna be like what are you talking about jerry these are great (laughs) oh no these are a little it tastes a little stale doesn't it does it taste stale no this is the freshest cookie i've ever had does your cookie have mouse shit on it don't ever say mouse (laughs) inside of an investment firm jerry you know that no those are just sprinkles just brush them off when this happens they're like we can't use this because they're gonna go stale rose is like we wasted a whole goddamn day and chip looks on as <laughs> kate comes in and it's just like listen guy it's gonna be fine we're gonna have to work a little harder sure we are fuck that what we've got each other and that's a lot for love we'll give it a thought We cut to Kate's house at night. Is it? There's a moment, Chad, we're watching this even for the second time. I'm like, wait, is this her house? Is this Clara's house? Why is Clara there? Why did she leave? But then she came back. What the fuck is going on? What is their relationship again? Let's just say that it's Kate's house and it's night. Chip is there. Clara is there. The lady from the post office with the chiclets in her mouth. And they're all eating Chinese food. But Chip only eats the fortune cookies because he loves sweets just like Buddy the Elf. And then chip's fortune says something about having music in your life every day and then clara tells their knockoff alexa device she's like hey ava play christmas carol her voice is too weak to activate it they couldn't use the actual wake-up name of alexa like would they have been sued for that amazon owns that shit i'm sure amazon would be like no you can't put our name on this whatever it is you're doing Chip is amazed and confused by this magical device. And Kate's over there on the couch on her laptop. She's like, knock it off, guys. I'm on the phone with my credit card company. I'm trying to run a business or something. And then Clara says, Kate's not into Christmas magic. We got to fix this by the end of act three. I have some clothes that'll fit you, Chip. Let's leave this scene. Oh my God. So outside, Clara has Chip in some kind of Saved by the Bell reunion outfit. Yeah, it's this 80s neon pastel parachute pants and a Ocean Pacific t-shirt and this acid wash denim jacket. I think it's supposed to be funny and I'm like, oh, is this going to go somewhere? But again, put this in the category of stupid shit this movie does that doesn't matter at all later on. Yeah, and they come back inside from admiring his outfit on the porch, I guess, right? to find Kate asleep on the couch. So then this creepy stranger picks up Kate, carries her upstairs, puts her in her bed bed Mm -hmm. if you remove the twinkling and magical musical underscore and replace it with long drawn out notes from large stringed instruments you would think he's gonna kill this woman well there's a moment here where he just stares at a picture of her as a child and is just like whispering to her it's gonna be a nice christmas (laughs) and uh, like all you've got to do like you said change the music and this immediately becomes silent night deadly night five you know the next morning kate wakes up and she comes down stairs and buddy the sorry chip the nutcracker he has decorated her whole house with decorations but unlike in the movie 
elf where Buddy made all of the decorations by hand. Here, one must assume that Chip went out and stole all these decorations from her neighbors. It, Christmas has exploded in her home. Chip appears with hot chocolate and this scrawny ash tree has now blossomed and been decorated with all the ornaments like, oh my god, these are the ornaments I loved when I was a kid. My mom used to decorate the tree at night when we were asleep. She would really dent a bottle of Admiral Nelson's spice rum and we'd find her passed out on the floor in front of the tree like, I found you yesterday morning. You smell like candy canes and know all the things I liked when I was a child. There's a whole lot of throw pillows and poinsettias everywhere, but the set (laughs) still looks really cheap. Well, it's because half of it is poinsettias. That is doing a lot of heavy lifting in this scene. There's probably about 30 of them in any given shot. Why isn't there an element in this narrative where if she doesn't pay the rent by Christmas Day, she's out on her ass? Because then when the video is posted to social media and the line out the door shows up, it's like, oh, Chip the Nutcracker showed up. More people are showing up. We're making more money. And she's not going to get, you know, thrown out on her keister during the holidays. And just get rid of this whole, you got to make cookies for the army bullshit and then you got a bad guy the real answer is hey this is a first draft we're making 30 of them these (laughs) all right everyone what you got uh nutcracker comes to life perfect perfect 80 pages (laughs) thursday oh jesus christ tuesday sir i know what i said make it (laughs) magical So we come back to the bakery and there is a line out the door to buy cookies that this establishment is not staffed to meet the demand of its customers. And some kid is watching Chip crack nuts with his hands on his iPhone. It's the video clip that Rosa uploaded. And Chip goes over and is amazed by this technology. And then Mark, the ex-boyfriend, still dressed up like Santa Claus, he's doing a little crowd work with some kids. He's like, hey, what do you want for Christmas? And where are you from? What do you do for a living, little boy? And then all the kids run off to go see Chip, the guy who cracked nuts from the internet kate goes inside and rosa says sorry i didn't ask before posting that video of your new boyfriend with his nuts in his hand as well as that other video of him at the bakery cracking those nut shells <laughs> i got a video of your boyfriend with his balls in his hands <laughs> He never poops, though. I know, because I've been watching. In another, in a a series of head-scratching business decisions, faced with this sudden influx of business, she announces, Kate does, Look, nobody's baking anything today. We're just selling cookies. Forget about the 14,000 cookies we gotta bake. We're taking a day off, everyone. You're, wait, wait. You're what? We're taking a day off. Look, let's just sell some cookies. I don't know how much they cost because I've never charged for them before. I have a little box up front and it says suggested donation dollar sign. Every day I make $15 and some rat turds. I have everyone to pay with a few dollars, some spare change, or a poem. You'd be surprised how many people pick the third. She's a terrible businesswoman. And yeah, it, right. She's really bad at this. And then she, again, proving her prowess as a businesswoman, says, listen, Chip, you're the craziest son of a bitch I've met in years. Would you like a promotion? And <laughs> promotes him to customer service. The great thing about this, Chad, A, uh, is, is them deciding that they're not going to bake anything all day long, which seems crazy to me. So what? They're all standing at the sales counter? Yeah. Just selling cookies to people that come in? Maybe selling, maybe maybe listening to slam poetry, who knows? All right. And Chad, if you're going to watch this movie, the extra acting in this scene in particular uh-huh. is moi. Because they kind of CGI some nuts flying in and popping away and stuff. And watching is this one people, all the kids are there? Yes. Of them just watching wide-eyed as shit is flying everywhere. Wink, uh-huh. wink. Oh, it's good extra work. I watched this with my 13-year-old son. Well, excuse me. My 13-year-old son came in the room and watched about eight minutes of this movie before he walked away in shame and disgust as what his father was doing with his life. But during this scene, (laughs) he pointed out that there is a wide shot of the kids watching him crack nuts with his hands. And then they take the same shot 
shot, but then they zoom in on it and you see the same facial reactions from all the children. He was just like, what was the budget of this film? This looks like garbage. And I was like, yeah, that's what makes it funny. And he was just like, you really have disappointed me, father. And then he left. <laughs> I was like, why did you call me father? And he was like, just to prove a point. Because that's the most condescending way to say it. And aside from shitting on your bed. Yeah, I, I got that after he walked away. Later, this lady Ginger comes by. The one who has eight kids and wears a little hat on her head. Yeah, with with six you get egg roll lady. Uh-huh. Shows up and is like, hey, I'd like to put up a sign for this Christmas ball that's happening tonight. I'm terrible at marketing. And Chip <laughs> is like, I think that sounds like a great idea. Let me have that poster and get the hell out. And so she leaves <laughs> and he goes back into the kitchen where he finds Rosa and he's like, hey, can I put this sign up in the window about the ball where everybody will be dancing tonight? He's like, I don't know. Can you take off your pants real quick? <laughs> I know what balls I want to see. And I don't need to wait till tonight, Chipperoni. Rosa says, look, Kate never goes to the Christmas ball and therefore would never support her community in this way by <laughs> simply <laughs> posting a sign in a window. So Chip is like, I'm going to go ask her why not? Because that's fucking crazy. So Kate then breezes through the kitchen, distinctly at this point, not micromanaging anybody. Yeah, it's 48 hours later, but Right, but they're asking things like, hey, are these done and is this poisonous? And she's like, oh, it's fine. It'll all work out. <laughs> it's Christmas, everybody. What is the acceptable level of rat fur we can allow in our cookies? As much as you want. It's the holidays. Just say it's Harry Snowflake. So later on, everybody is kind of gathered around the oven counting down, except for Kate, who comes strolling by and she's like, hey, what are you guys doing counting down at the oven? And they pull out, uh, as the, the timer goes off, they pull out this fully baked and decorated cake jet, which is not how ovens work, I'll tell you right now. That, no. <laughs> that doesn't cook on, I've learned. And then the, the cake, though, says, uh, will you go to the ball with me or something like that? Like, if you squint, it says that. <laughs> but he gets down on one knee like it's a big, fancy deal. And also because they're both fucking crazy lest we forget that if he'd have done that to rosa she would have had him pants down against the wall in the cooler riding him like a reindeer as soon as his face was vagina level off go the pants and she is grabbing the back of his head you better put on a snorkel or learn to breathe through your ears buddy boy hope you brought a lunch there's a secondary joke here where justin drops to one knee on his own with a cupcake as though he's gonna ask rosa to the ball but she kind of inadvertently smacks the cupcake and it hits him in the face yeah. You're like justin's such a loser he, yes he in the great <laughs> history of cinematic losers he is right up there <laughs> with like cousin paulie from the rocky movies he got cousin paulie willie loman and justin from <laughs> yeah a very nutty christmas sure Yes, and Herman from Scrooged. That's a that's a sap that doesn't work out for. Her. So anyway, Kate, her friend Ginger, squeals because Kate has showed up at her dress shop to try on a bunch of outfits. Dude, this place looks like a consignment shop that your grandmother visits and leaves empty-handed and disappointed week after week. It's three clothing racks and a mirror. There's this pretty woman montage with generic canned Christmas music, and then Kate finds a dress, and then she gets her hair done. Yeah. And then it's nighttime and the Christmas ball's happening. And so Clara and Kate are awaiting Chip, who appears in a carriage, like a horse-drawn carriage. Yeah. And Claire is like, go on now, get laid, have a good time. <laughs> and she says, I'll see you at the ball later. You know, I've got that side piece that I'm really hoping finally seals the deal tonight. I'm going to smoke a little crack cocaine before I get there to calm my nerves. I'm about to knock the dust off this thing. So we cut to the Christmas ball that's taking place in a very small community theater. <laughs> yeah, where the ballet will be later that night or tomorrow or whenever. Yeah, it's t tomorrow night. We see Mark the ex-boyfriend, and he is not dressed as Santa Claus for the first time on our movie. And he gets out of the passenger side of a car where his new girlfriend, Tiffany, turns out she's driving. And these two are already fighting with one another. Right. But then I was like, the makeup sex is going to be awesome. Also, again, this is, if I may define the female fantasy movie a little bit further as i see it part of it too oh, please do is having this ex-boyfriend 
that's kind of a loser like he's the equivalent of somebody who does a little couch surfing like you're driving them around in your car that kind of shit yeah. that is middle-aged dating right most of the guys are real shit balls. that i think is again we're playing to that demographic that's like oh yeah i dated that guy the one that was like hey can you come pick me up yes I recognize this, Melissa Joan Hart. And then on top of that, Kate and Chip show up in this horse-drawn carriage. Right. And I was like, am I supposed to be happy for Kate? Because she wasn't a very nice person earlier. Did she earn this in any way? Or was this just thrown in her lap? Is that part of the formula? Look, it's Christmas magic, Chad. Shut the fuck up and enjoy it. All right. And Tiffany is pissed at Mark because as they're going into the Christmas ball, Tiffany sees this horse-drawn carriage pull up and she's just like, here I am driving you around, you piece of shit. And he's just like, oh, don't worry about it, babe. Well, I'll tell you what, you can give me a head in the bathroom later. A little makeup be you know babe what's inside the christmas ball uh, which kind of looks like uh it's taking place at the uh, meeting hall inside of a la quinta over on route 12 <laughs> yeah if you look close there's a, a belgian breakfast a couple of small boxes of lucky charms <laughs> i think there's a vending machine that somehow still sells cigarettes there's a cigarette machine and one of those like coin operated pool tables but inside <laughs> again here's more female fancy stuff where like as they're going up the stairs chip is like you look like a princess and then he whispers some crazy German curse to her like the old man did, <laughs> which probably is what makes her so crazy. But then she says, hey, what did you this say to me? What was that crazy word you said? <laughs> and he's like, I was just saying that you're as beautiful as the stars in a foreign language because I'm sophisticated. And then they walk in, Chad. They, like, mount the stairs. And as they come in, again, some quality extra acting, just people are like, holy shit. So beautiful. Right. Oh, my God. This woman with some slightly saggy biceps in this princess dress is stunning <laughs> and look at this crazy man she's with she looks like the mother at any little girl's beauty pageant the one who <laughs> used to be a pageant winner you know <laughs> you are gonna get up on that stage Go, come here i'm gonna I'm, let me put this vaseline on your teeth i was miss junior oklahoma two years in a row don't you get out there and embarrass our family legacy that's as many as you can be before you're not junior anymore i just never made it in the bigs you're gonna do it so to really class up this affair they go upstairs and there's a silent auction happening and if you're not familiar with silent auctions, here's how it works. There's something being auctioned off. In this case, it's gift baskets. You write down your name and how much you want to bid on it. And then someone comes behind you and they can outbid you with a higher offer. And then at the end of the night, all of the cheapskates like me rush around and try to outbid other people by putting the minimum amount that they would have to pay for something that's more valuable than the amount that they're actually going to pay for it. It's real world eBay sniping. It's the home game. It's usually for charity, but most assholes like myself are like, what kind of fucking idiot would spend more than $100 on a $100 gift certificate? You dummy. Charity? Who the fuck is charity? <laughs> after after Kate explains all these happenings to Chip and what silent auctions are, Rosa and Justin show up. And Justin then just steals a bunch of tickets to this Hawaiian vacation. And I don't know how this process works. Like, is it one per person in theory, but also some people just get handfuls? I thought that they had to pay for them because that's how this normally works with a raffle. But I don't know. So Chip then throws some shade at a Chinese nutcracker that he sees in one of the baskets or whatever. And Kate's like, you seem really upset about all this nutcracker business. Although it's strange that you've never changed clothes clothes are slept or blinked or oh, shit look i know when the toilet flushes in my house because it backs up in the kitchen that has only happened when i have fit it's because i flush all of my tampons i know the plumber told me not to do it but i don't care what does he know just clean them <laughs> out unplug it up that's what i chant at him like a reverse carry so in our movie all of the characters that we've met decide to sit down to the same table we have kate and chip the nutcracker rosa and justin claire the old lady is there for some reason ginger is there without all of her kids and then mark the ex-boyfriend and tiffany the sexy elfin photo assistant new girlfriend all take a seat and then ginger the mom of eight says to chip do your hands hurt from cracking all those nuts and then tiffany just pops out of her seat and says i'm a masseuse i'll massage your hands and she goes over and just starts rubbing chip's hands and he just lets out these oh oh my god moans it's like hey rosa get your camera you got another movie 
cake happening tonight. Wow, you just had me cook all your cookies and crack all your nuts. She's massaging my hand and said she's going to give me some work later in that she's promised me a blowjob. That's from the jerk. She told me she's got a tattoo here on her thigh that says slippery when wet. She (laughs) said she'll do all the things that Rosa did to me without me asking or wanting. (laughs) She said that she loves to play musical instruments, especially the rusty trombone. She asked me if I'd ever seen Freddy got fingered, and I told her no, and she said, you will. So all these people are hanging out together at this table, and Rosa is chit-chatting with Mark a little bit, and he's like, hey, you think I did something stupid by breaking up with that old lady? And Rosa is like, no, honey, you did her a favor, and you did yourself a favor, too, because I'm about to rock your world. (laughs) and then clara chimes in to remind everyone that she's still alive and is like my nephew is stationed in germany that nutcracker fella looks a lot like him and then everybody's like yeah yeah, yeah, old lady we're having like (laughs) we're talking about fucking and stuff nobody's worried about old lady talk right now about this time ginger pops up and she says the silent auction is ending in one minute so then chip gets up and he runs over and puts kate's name on every auction sheet and outbids everyone and then he just takes a bunch of raffle tickets and throws them in this bowl to win this trip for two to hawaii again i don't think that he paid for those i think he just ripped them off the roll and chunked them in the bucket yeah also what money does chip have like none he is he has no concept of currency so right what happens is they start going through the list of people on the silent auction forms and are like oh my goodness it looks like kate won this basket of cheese And oh my goodness, it looks like she won this other basket because of cheese. Chip has gone around and signed her name to all of this shit. Like it's her name on these forms. Oh, she's on the hook for all this. Yeah, she got to pay for this. She didn't win it. Yeah. She has to pay for it. Right. This is like he borrowed his dad's credit card, you know, thinking, well, this will never come back to me. It's fucking nuts. So anyway, Ginger also leads uh, Chip downstairs because there's a big dance, right? Yeah, like 30 people at this ball. Right. And all the ladies want to dance with Chip because he's quite a dish in this little town. Well, there's only five men at this ball. There's a whole lot of women dancing with women, and it's not like lesbian couples. They just look like lonely, older, single women women who couldn't find dates yeah it's kind of sad Eh, you know they're there to support each other that's kind of nice i guess and so kate is watching all this from above and mark staggers over and is like hey babe you want to dance and she's like you know what i do want to dance but not with you mr thanapants so she goes downstairs with rosa and she finds (laughs) chip and they dance and it's like beauty and the fucking beast or something at your local community theater lobby (laughs) it's as epic as the movie gets and that's not much a couple of quick notes uh, that'll pay off later kinda there's a bit with justin dancing with chip briefly and he's like hey teach me to dance and that kind of comes back later kate wins the trip to hawaii we get a moment with mark and tiffany after they're continuing humiliations throughout this scene where Mark's uh-huh. just like defeated hey babe I asked the old lady and she said no you want to dance did you notice during this scene of them drunk at the bar that they're playing the bridge music from it's always sunny in Philadelphia no I didn't notice that it's really strange because that is such a signature musical connection for it's always sunny and to hear it somewhere else is off-putting yeah but yeah when he asks her hey you want to dance babe she's like do you want to follow that that? Did you say uh, everybody was staring at that like it was Beauty and the Beast? Are you crazy? Shut up in a carriage and the guy driving it had an adorable puppy and a beard and a top hat. I drove you here. So stupid. Hate you. I'm already on the fence about all of this because dating the town granny shagger. Getting sloppy seconds from Kate. And I got pregnant three times the other night or something. Is there a baby in my mouth right now? Take a look and see. Ah. Uh... I know there's one in my belly button. That's how they get in. So we cut over to Kate and Chip, and he, and she is asking him, like, do you really have to leave on Christmas Eve? That kind of sucks. And he says, uh, I'm sorry, I can't change that. 
and then we go to break, uh, which happens surprisingly in this movie because I'm so used to the the normal Hollywood movies or to yeah, some degree. You get those, and, those fade to black for commercials. Yeah, and then when we come back from it, it's like Kate looking at a picture and Chip just shows up in her bedroom. They're back at her house. Yeah, to be like, I had a great night. And then they just have a moment of awkward good nights and then don't bone, which is weird. No, she's clearly looking for a roll in the sack, but it doesn't happen. And then we cut to the next morning and Chip is gone. So Kate goes to the bakery, you know, because it's 1130 and Chip's inside and he's making cookies and uh, Justin's just sitting around doing jack shit and Chip's in the back and Kate goes to see him and Chip says, hey, these cookies aren't going to make themselves because apparently he knows how to run a business. And then Chip says, I got a new cookie. It's called the Nut Chip. And then he spins some saccharine yarn about how these cookies are the story of a man who meets a woman, but they don't have sex or something. <laughs> right. and I was like, if he did have sex with her, could he get her pregnant? Is that how a Pinocchio gets born? <laughs> no, but he can create the Antichrist. When oh, something God. with no soul mates with uh, a human, w- what has a soul, uh, that's how you get uh, the devil child. Kate says, our goal today is 3,000 cookies. Because remember, we didn't make any yesterday. So let's get baking. And then all four of our workers do their thing and they bake cookies. And then that all happens and they put sprinkles on them, whatever. And then we get a montage. And yeah, the, the best part of the montage is uh, as it wraps up, it kind of culminates with Kate just staring at chip just like oh my god (laughs) can you imagine how big his dong is i bet he's got a great big dong rosa pops in and it's just like listen girl you need to rub it out and get to work we've got cookies to make she's like you're right give me five minutes in my office and then i'm good to go also it's kind of hairy in there because of all the rats so instead of the office i'm gonna use the lobby but it's still just gonna take five minutes I love how our male sensibilities are finding their way into this movie that has none of this. Out in the lobby, all those school-aged children show up again screaming and yelling about free cookies. Uh, But that scene doesn't matter. No. So it's now the end of the eight-hour workday, and Chip says, Golly, we made 6,000 cookies today. And I'm like, no, you didn't. That means each and every one of you had to crank out 200 cookies every hour. You did not do that. And better yet, Chad, once they have, like, are those numbers good? Did we really make 6,000 cookies? That's right. We did. Immediately, they're like, we should take tomorrow off. No! (laughs) You finished that order! You don't take the day off! Kate is just immediately like, yeah, let's really make fifth one go down to the wire you guys take tomorrow off and then we'll just see what happens on monday better yet let's just set the place on fire and burn it to the ground just turn on the gas when we leave and let it go this weekend if we come back in the buildings here it was fate to make those cookies if it's a (laughs) smoking crater well that was fate too We get another montage of Kate and Chip playing in the snow and trying on funny hats and they put on ugly Christmas sweaters and they go ice skating and Kate is in the holiday spirit now. And then Mark the X, we see him in his Santa suit and he stares at Chip and Kate as they're ice skating and Tiffany says that uh, Chip's a better man than you are, Mark. And I got he's got a great big dong. And then that doesn't really go anywhere. And then Kate tells Chip, she says, you know, I'm falling in love with with everything. And then Kate kisses Chip and Chip says, golly, can we do that again? And then they smooch again. My favorite part of all of this is when Mark and Tiffany are checking out them skating and stuff. The kids all flee the Santa to go see these people figures skating on account of children's undying love of figure skating chad that is the most norm mcdonald joke of the episode by the way so just officially (laughs) so kate leaves the montage to go change clothes and she says hey chip i'll meet you at the nutcracker ballet later tonight because i have assumed that you're going to be performing in it maybe and by the way this movie's kind of almost over yeah we're real close to the end and and so she goes home and she gets a a text from out there 
And they're like, hey, we're sorry that the weirdo that we were going to send to live in your bedroom uh, had to cancel due to illness. She should call the police immediately, go to her neighbor's house and hide until help arrives. Right. And instead, she goes out front and she like checks under the mat and finds the key that she left for a stranger. Also not a great idea, but that's a conversation for a different time. How did he get in my house? Right. Maybe it was that open window in my kitchen. Maybe. So then she goes to the tent where she got the nut cracker uh-huh. but the old dude is gone and there is maybe my favorite line delivery of the movie is uh-huh. when she has this old silver fox behind her like where did this old man go and he just hilariously in the background goes that crazy old man he went back home to germany <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was pretty good chad the whole scene felt like big when tom hanks goes back to the wharf looking for the zoltar machine the wind is blowing everything is stripped down the lights have been turned off so she doesn't know which end is up so she goes to the theater where they had had the christmas ball the night before but now it's the location of the local production of the nutcracker ballet and kate just wanders around the village square and she's really pissed off that it took kate this long to figure out that chip is a weirdo and then kate makes her way to the theater and chip is really happy to see kate because he's chip and then kate is super pissed off and she says aren't you supposed to be on stage and i'm like wait this whole misunderstanding is kate's fault she assumed that he's in this ballet production and then at the same time she kind of forced him into day labor at her bakery and she was never really curious as to why he never went to rehearsals or talked about his time dancing chip mentioned at one point that he was a soldier in the german army but we don't really ever talk about what decade that took place because that might be uncomfortable but it's like none of this is chip's fault this is all on her yeah maybe it's why she's so pissed off because she knows it's her own damn fault and he very reasonably asks her like hey kate what's wrong you know what throng, Mr. Man. And under a hail of shushes as they take their seats, she tells him, like, he's a liar. And he says, you know, I never lied to you, Kate. Going into a full theater with a hysterical woman in her 40s who is totally <laughs> pissed <laughs> off. Keep that shit in the lobby. But also, they just decide that they're going to sit together and, and go through this horrible evening anyway. Surrounded by about 98 other people. But let me tell you, Chad, real middle-aged dating move. Like, th- hey, this is not going well but let's not give up hope yet (laughs) i paid for these tickets i paid 18 dollars and 50 cents before the convenience fee all right she's crazy she just accused me of lying to her about something i never said to her but i don't know maybe her kids are nice the ballet starts and they watch and we see snippets of the ballet and over the duration kate kind of realizes that chip is the nutcracker come to life and so she kind of falls in love with him again or something and kind of sort of but even after she's like okay he's a nutcracker that explains everything right like a lot of pieces are falling into place kind of also i have to question now my fundamental belief in i don't know reality because now i know there's magic (laughs) physics god religion science i don't know if this is pagan magic this doesn't seem to be specifically a christian nutcracker but it could be and i've got a a lot of questions for him about is there a god do you know what made you i'm gonna spend the rest of my adult life chasing after other magic on the planet because i know it exists now she's never gonna find it no like she is gonna die like one of those crazy people chasing crystal skulls in peru or some shit it's like somebody seeing a ufo when they were 17 and it just fucks them up forever a hundred percent they spend the rest of their lives self-publishing books about ufos on amazon and and living alone and this is her right like it's gonna be magic is real is book number one and then like as things start to devolve and she's going to conventions and now she's doing tarot card readings to make ends meet and she knows it's bullshit but she also knows magic is real and she kind of makes that bargain with herself but then she has to drink a little bit to kind of bury the shame and and the feeling that she was supposed to be something more because once upon a time chad she touched real magic And then finally, you know, somebody finds her in a hotel room. (laughs) 
<laughs> when they come to clean because her kidneys have just given out. So that's kind of the sequel I propose. <laughs> Dear God, please let them make a sequel to this film and let that be the plot. Fucking nutty Christmas too. <laughs> yeah, existential nightmare. But at, when she's like, I know you're a nutcracker now. And he's like, <laughs> well, hey, how about I just walk you home? And she's like, look, I can see myself home, all right? toy <laughs> and the next day she's back in the kitchen it's one day until christmas there's a thousand cookies left to go <laughs> sad christmas music is playing so you know we're not doing anything good here uh right. she's back to being kind of the bitchy micromanaging boss and out front though chip is just waiting for her. where did he sleep the night before did he sleep at her house or a barn i mean a park bench uh, one presumes <laughs> so, like, maybe he tried to pawn his ruby hat for a night or whatever <laughs> i mean what does he care like he's he's back to being a toy in a day and a half so who gives a shit so right. like hey i want the experience of not getting hypothermia by sleeping out in this <laughs> cold weather i'm a magic creature of satan or whatever ships in the lobby and he says do you want me to leave kate and kate says you're already gone just go just go just go and so Chip goes outside and he says, I will not go. I will keep you safe from the Mouse King. And it's all terribly confusing. Inside the bakery, as you said, it's a terribly sad scene. Justin goes outside and Chip says that he's going to wait for the Mouse King to come. But off in the distance behind him, we see Mark, the ex-boyfriend, still at his Santa post. And it's kind of a sad foreground background shot. And then Rosa makes her way into the office to surprisingly not find Kate getting drunk. Drunk. And Rosa says, why did you kick Chip out? Does he have VD or something? And Kate says, no, he isn't real. He's a toy. He's a wooden nutcracker come to life. And Rosa says, so you need to hit that. You need to take a video and upload it to freakyporn.com. I will give you my username and password and you can upload it to my account. And Kate says, yeah, I need to not be an asshole anymore. Wait, what? So she's not a jerk now? Yeah, there's some nonsense about, like, he was just a made-up magic toy person. And Rosa is like, that's more real than some people ever get in their whole lives. And you're like, what? No. So what you're saying, he is a male sex doll? Girl, that sounds amazing wham bam thank you sir we cut to martini's bar where mark <laughs> the ex-boyfriend shows up still dressed as santa to get drunk and he finds chip and chip's there working on his third strawberry daiquiri and chip keeps saying the mouse king is coming and kate made me leave and then mark the ex pays the bartender like 10 20 bucks to keep chip drunk and talking while he goes and woos kate because he has now learned that the two of them are broken up yeah and to keep him talking the bartender is like um so where are you from i guess oh that's a real interesting story <laughs> yeah. let me start at the very beginning i come from germany the land of candy canes and ice cream and der Fuhrer. <laughs> and then kate goes running after chip after she has her pep talk with rosa who's like girl you need to go hit that wooden shit then she asks the christmas tree guy if he <laughs> He's seen Chip and he just goes, no, that crazy motherfucker. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it, he is real dismissive of this dude. Mr. Christmas tree expert. Mr. I know everything about Christmas tree stance. Now I haven't seen that, that asshole. Kate goes looking for him in the square and she goes to the ice skating rink, but he's not there. And then best of all, she goes back to that 50 foot tall Christmas tree where he shimmered up to try to put the star on top. She just stands at the bottom of it and stares at the top of the tree. Like Chip would go there like when he's scared or wounded L let all of his sadness yeah. melt away <laughs> So yeah. while she's on the hunt, she hears the honk of a horn, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and we cut back to some dudes with fake mustaches, uh, like curly Q mustaches. They look like Salvador Dali. <laughs> well, I mean, they look like if you dressed a child up as Salvador Dali, it would be this level of hair and makeup. These two guys that are there in this delivery truck to pick up all the cookies, one of them's a big fat guy and the other one is small and scrawny and... And they are working in out of a delivery truck and they're all dressed in gray. And the fat one has a rope that inexplicably is wrapped over his shoulder, but around his asshole to make it look like a tail. And like you said, they have these mustaches and the little ones eating cheese. And the name on the side of the truck is Mousel and Sons Trucking. And this is both the 
stupidest thing in this movie and the most clever thing in the whole film. Yeah, it, it kind of is. Because it, it's really dumb and it's really poorly executed. But it yeah. is kind of like, oh, okay. There, it, Mousel and Sons Trucking is the name of the company. And what happens is Chip shows up and he sees through this window, like there's a, a, a pillar or something in between him and the truck so that it cuts off some of the the advertising on the truck so that it just says mouse king kate goes up to the two drivers and says oh thank goodness you're here let's load up these cookies and the fat driver says oh we don't load the cookies we just drive the truck and then kate says oh okay we'll load them and then the fat driver says nah this is a union truck you can't load them up unless you're union but if you give me five thousand bucks we'll make you a temporary union member and i was like i kind of like this i like a christmas eve shakedown yeah oh absolutely and then chip shows up and he's a little bit drunk (laughs) sure (laughs) ready to start a fight yeah and kate is like where have you been and he's like uh, i was at the bar with santa she's like wait a minute santa my ex-boyfriend he told me he never saw you when i asked him earlier he's like oh yeah he he was there and i was getting drunk and he was getting drunk and then he ran off and said he was gonna get back in your panties i don't know what those are mouse king so she spins this whole business around on the truckers and is like listen my drunk sex toy boyfriend is gonna beat you up if you don't let us load this he's truck. got a katana thord that he bought at that weird store in the mall that sells god's eyes and crystals and deodorant that you can't get anywhere else he'll cut you bastards up so load up my truck and they're like yes ma'am yes ma'am but then they don't load the truck now all the friends and neighbors show up like everybody you've seen in the movie so far appears to help load up this truck and they load the boxes kind of like an old fireman's line like they're handing one box to the next person I'm like don't you have a dolly right you're doing this wrong yeah this is just like this fireman's line that goes from the cookie bakery portion all the way to the truck but it's all terribly disorganized it's run as well as anything else is in this stupid business but let's wrap this movie yeah up. so children end up booing mark because he was a big liar and then he gets yeah, all these off. kids attack santa claus on christmas eve could you even imagine such a thing in the real world yes i have imagined it <laughs> but so ginger shows up and she's like oh my god with santa claus being an asshole who's gonna read the christmas story tonight who cares and immediately chip is like i'll do it and so we cut to that and he's doing it and he changes the words to suit his filthy nutcracker needs so he changes the name of santa from the original story that's not the way it goes but and all these kids are gonna grow up thinking it's wrong <laughs> it's like when uh, i only read the word navajo as a kid and spent the first 17 years of my life pronouncing it navajo because i didn't know any better chad (laughs) and so later uh after all this is over with we cut to (laughs) kate and chip just drinking milk in her kitchen like you do because again you're older you don't want to drink too much you feel terrible the Uh next day and a little milk soothes the stomach (laughs) chad i got a feeling that hers was white chocolate liqueur but this whole movie is the cinematic equivalent of that kids in the hall sketch where they pour kalua on a cheesecake (laughs) so anyway the power goes out and Kate is like, oh, damn it, I need to light some candles. And she goes in the kitchen, but when she comes back, uh, sure enough, using his, his evil magic, Chip has lit all the candles. Uh-huh. So they just snuggle on the couch, Chad. No uh-huh. funny business, just some snuggles. That's all. And she says, I wish you could stay forever. And then she falls asleep, which is, again, the most middle-aged date ever. It's an argument. <laughs> An argument at the ballet, some drama after, and then you both just end up falling asleep on the couch after, on the back end of it all. She comes to the next morning, and Chip has turned back into the Nutcracker, or at the very least, Chip left in the still of the night and placed a Nutcracker on the table in his absence. (laughs) Ha ha, the poifit crime. Kate then goes next door to start giving all of her friends and neighbors the gift baskets that she bought at the silent auction. She goes to Clara's house, then she goes to Ginger's house, and Ginger's there with all of her kids and ginger's totally put together on christmas morning which no she's not kate goes over to rosa's house and it turns out justin 
is there, and these two are wearing matching adult onesie holiday themed pajamas. Man, you're jumping into this relationship both feet. You haven't been dating two weeks and you're already in matching outfits. It's gonna end badly. Oh yeah, one of you is killing the other. And <laughs> and hey, by the way, spoilers, it's gonna be Rosa killing him. Kate gives them the trip to Hawaii that she won, and she's inviting everybody to come to her house for Christmas dinner. So then we cut to Kate coming home from the grocery store with a turkey that she's going to make for Christmas dinner, which is total bullshit because no grocery stores are open on Christmas Day, and you're not just going to go buy a turkey like this and pop it in the oven, unless it's a fresh turkey, which it's not. Again, none of this is anywhere within the confines of a believable state of behavior in the real world. No. And so Clara, the neighbor, has a surprise visitor, Chad. Because out the window, Kate spies a guy who looks a whole lot like Chip only not right. dressed like a maniac uh-huh. and, and so very much like a maniac kate rushes out and just hugs this guy and he's like uh hello ma'am <laughs> are you looking for your grandchild <laughs> right <laughs> you're sucking my arm and then clara comes out <laughs> and is like that's my nephew and she's like hey this guy looks exactly like that nutcracker guy that i was dating remember him oh yeah i guess she does look a little bit like him. well she's right up front about it. she's like i told you that i said it when we had that dinner at that stupid dance i told you those squirrels are coming in my house and stealing my pennies i would love it if that were true i love the idea <laughs> of a tree full of pennies somewhere with <laughs> uh, the richest squirrels you ever saw lord over it so then ginger shows up with all of her kids and there's no dad to be seen in this household and, and then kate sees clara's nephew crack a walnut in his hand and she all but swoons yeah and then clara's nephew starts teaching justin to ballroom dance which is a callback to a scene you mentioned earlier i can only assume that the conversation between these two had to be extremely awkward or surprisingly comfortable Bo. i think it could be both for each of them i think that maybe it's going to start comfortable and i think it's going to become very very awkward for justin when he realizes that maybe the nephew isn't there just for dance lessons oh i'm seeing that rather chubby woman over there with the impressive bosom (laughs) the one who keeps looking at pornography on her phone yes that's the one turning the screen around to show us and the children yes that's her that's my girl so dinner's ready everyone sits at the table the military nephew pulls a chair out for kate very gentlemanly he says this at your service thing which has been a through line it's sort of the as you wish of this movie yeah well i don't know we've talked too much about that because it was really watered down and <laughs> it's, didn't matter right none of this matters at all but then after dinner we're washing dishes with rosa yes and they're having a little dish session as they do the dishes chad and rosa is immediately like look at that piece of ass you got that hot guy in there you need to show him your bedroom later tonight p.s if you find a pair of panties in your bathroom trash can they're mine if you don't find them justin took them for his collection he's into dirty panties it's a game that we play we have a lot of little games that's what keeps everything fresh after two weeks except for my panties they're dirty after one hour you but so she sends kate after the nephew like go get you some girl (laughs) and he gives her a gift because he's like hey you've been so good to my aunt here's a present and it's clearly a nutcracker he's like i didn't have that he bought at the airport (laughs) when he landed here in the united states he says though it's from it's from siphon germany the home of the it's from the px and and it comes with a note for her like in Uh theory he bought this from this drosselmeyer dude who had gone back to Germany to sell another Nutcracker to him to bring to her to be like, hey, this guy looks like that Nutcracker you were fucking right, Uh I guess. I bet the one that he sold him, he probably marked up 200% (laughs) to make up the what he lost when he gave her the one one at the beginning. The magic ones are free. The ones that aren't magic are $300. But yeah, so the note says like, hey, remember the magic of Christmas or whatever. It actually says that or whatever. The old guy from this movie. And then Clara is like, Ava, play some Christmas music. And then everybody sings, and then we get a closing shot of the Nutcracker, the one that Kate was uh, about to have sex with, that's now a toy, and it winks, 
And I was like, man, what a horrifying notion that this sentient little deviant elf on a shelf is just watching the doings of your home from now on. It's a frightening ending. It's watching a guy that looks like it live a life with the woman it loves. The end. Yeah, the end. But because this movie is full of insane magic and plot holes that you could drive a planet through, why not make Chip into like a real boy at the end of it why do this switcheroo could they just let chip become a man like make that her christmas wish and then he just stays and he comes up with new cookie flavors and they live in this you know small town and make cookies and shit like he didn't need a social security card she's the breadwinner yeah he could get around all that right yeah right people disappear all the time chad i i'm i'm led to believe by the television shows i sometimes watch you you go to a guy that gets you a new id you get some dead guy social security number hey uh, clara's got this nephew in the war huh oh, oh, kill him yeah. maybe an accident happens shad maybe an accident shit that was how mad men started <laughs> That's right. We have a number of really good ideas for prequels and sequels for this movie. I would love to see a sequel of this where Chip comes back and murders the nephew and he feels no guilt, but Kate does. And it really splinters their relationship. Ooh, yeah. That'd be good. I would like this to serve as a prequel to Hellraiser where the search for real magic in the world leads Kate to the lament configuration you know and they're like oh we have such sights to show you kate that's never gonna happen. hey look a boy can dream chad if, if this movie has taught me nothing else it's that sometimes a little bit of fantasy goes a long way <sighs> in two weeks <laughs> yeah we will be back with another dose of lifetime holiday entertainment featuring one of the biggest stars of the internet and no i'm not talking about two girls one cup of eggnog or chewbacca mom's life day apology special next time we will bring you the lifetime original movie grumpy cat's worst christmas ever yeah is it the worst movie we've ever discussed on this podcast mm. Come back in two weeks and find out. But the answer is definitely maybe yes. It's maybe yes for sure. I think that the bar has been lowered to Christmas Vacation 2. I think we agreed that that fell below its pat, which was really holding on to that title for a while. And I think that this Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever may be worse than Christmas Vacation 2. Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure. Yeah, I would argue that a very nutty Christmas is very silly and it's very light and I understand what it is. I totally understand why it exists. I understand who this movie is for. But Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever is absolutely head-scratching. Yes. I feel that A Very Nutty Christmas is the kind of movie you could put on in the background while you're doing some baking or wrapping presents. You don't have to think about it. And you look up and a little something happens. You stitch it together and it, it's not going to make a difference in your life one way or the no. other. It's just colorful white noise during the holiday season. Yes, it is Christmassy background noise to your television viewing. Yes. But any, uh, Chad, do you have any final thoughts on this movie before we wrap it up? Being my first Lifetime movie, and I know that you and I've looked at a real variety of films that we're going to be discussing over the next five episodes i don't know that i would recommend this movie but i don't know that i would recommend against this movie i think that it's really in the bullseye of what i expected it's poorly executed the budget is low nobody really seems to care about anything in the movie and because of that i feel like i understand the charm of these films and i'll never watch another one of them again for the rest of my life yeah that feels right <laughs> how about you Bo? any final thoughts on this one i kind of agree with you i i think this is inoffensive christmas entertainment and if you're one of those people that just goes bananas for christmas and you're you had this movie on you're like hey that's a really sweet little movie yeah yeah sure fine I think the next episode is going to be mostly offensive Christmas entertainment. This one, like you said, if someone told me, I really like A Very Nutty Christmas, I'd be like, ah, you know, not for me, but I totally get it. If someone tells you that they like a Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever, if they tell you that as a person living on this planet to your face, you need to run away from that person and you need to yeah. you need to banish them from your life. You need to rethink how you're selecting your friends and just really who you're spending time with, even if they're 
they're not your friend. You don't need those kind of people in your life. So yeah. if you have a recommendation for this season and you are listening to this episode during the month of December in the year 2020, the year of our Lord, please email us at pick six movies at gmail.com. We have not completely decided which movies we will be reviewing for this season. We would love to hear your recommendations. You can also reach out to us via social media. We're all over the place. As always, like, rate, review, and let us know what you think of the show. Or more importantly, just tell a friend or just enjoy it on your own. Bo, it's been an honor to sort of break the seal of this brand new season and have a little bit of holiday cheer. And I look forward to tackling another episode in two weeks' time. I do too, Chad. I'm very excited. It's Christmas time. Uh, Let the festivities begin. Hear, 